Hello fellow homebrewers, JP here, and I want to introduce to you the brand new Brewbuilt X1 Conical Series available at More Beer. More Beer sells the highest standard in homebrewing equipment, and the Brewbuilt Conicals are just that. They're made from mere polished 304 stainless steel, and they come with loads of features that you and I have been looking for. They have a full 2-inch bottom dump valve, which will eliminate your clogging issues, while the sturdy base includes four reinforced legs, just like those big pro tanks do. More Beer also carries the Brewbuilt line of options and add ons like casters, pressure kits, and even external glycol chillers. So you can find out more about the new Brew Built X1 Conical Uni Tanks by going over to morebeer.com for detailed videos on the entire line of Brew Built Conicals. You can trust Brew Built with your next fermentation, and you can trust More Beer to find the right conical for you. Brew Built at morebeer.com. Today's Sunday session is brought to you thanks to the fine folks at More Beer. Visit them right now at morebeer.com. Feels like work. Shooting the shit for two hours, drinking beer and talking beer. What a wonderful experience. Can we not have the barf bucket near my mixing board? (laughs) (laughs) I think everybody can read the book. I knew you were going to use this book as an excuse to quit doing this show. (laughs) Mrs. Buff, if you want, I can mail you the bub timer. Yeah, Newcastle. Especially in the can. Have you ever had it in the can? (laughs) No, I have not had it in the can. (laughs) Notice I closed my eyes and I concentrated really hard. Now, live from the Brewing Network Studios in Northern California, this is the radio program for home brewers. Craft brewers, beer lovers, and beer geeks. It's your only source for live beer radio that brings expert brewers together with, well, expert drinkers. This is the radio program with a head on it. This is The Session. Session. My name's Justin Crossy. I'll be your host tonight. Back in the saddle. I see some things haven't changed. Oh, we got saddle. Half of us on cell phones. We got <laughs> Bebo wondering what the fuck she's doing in there. <laughs> everything's everything's the same. same yeah, it's everyone. like normal. Yeah, man. We'll it's keep, a new year, same us. We gotta keep leaving. Did you even leave? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, why would you? Okay. With this consistency. That's what it is. Everybody wants just a level of consistency. It's like when you're driving long distances. Yeah. I just want people to do the speed limit. That's all. <laughs> but just eat, but don't speed and then slow down. But that's just, what we provide to you. I like it. Consistency. I feel like it's working. Something you yeah. can count on. I texted you just now. Let's text to Over and over. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's... Doc was texting me, too. <laughs> something about something important about the show or... Oh, no. I just bought my mic and something. I couldn't, couldn't hear so good. <laughs> <laughs> Your mic couldn't hear so good? Uh, I couldn't hear so good. Oh. What's going on with Beardy's mic? I don't know. I'm going in and out of stereo or something. In and out, in and in out. I don't know. That been happening? Is anything happening still? No, you sound like you're half in my head and yeah, half exactly. down the hallway. Yeah, you're I was wondering both, if it was just my headphones or not. You're in both ears and I can hear him out of one. Who's luckier? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather hear it in no ears. I need to text <laughs> Justin about this. <laughs> yeah. See, I can mute him entirely if I just move the balance to the left, maybe? Yeah, I could just go home. Yeah, I'm all right with that. Yeah. Or, you know what? Why don't you come over here? We'll share a mic. Ooh. Yeah, yeah that'd be nice. We'll get close. <laughs> we'll get like close. Be great. Just like old times. Yeah. Oh. I was there for a second. Now it's like worse. Yeah. It's buzzing huh. in and hey. out. This wasn't happening before, huh? Keep, no. Huh. Keep jiggling the coil, huh. man. Try to talk now, Beardy. This is now it's over. Perfect. Perfect. Now it's great. Right. <laughs> yeah. Problem solved. Very even now. It's yeah. gone. How about now? We usually work all this shit out before the show. Uh, I didn't think to test the microphones. Nothing nothing had changed. Right. Yeah. How about now? Nope. No, same. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, that's awful. Let's get Schumann in here. You, you've done what, it. To make you it more awful? Sound worse than yeah, I yeah, to make it more do. awful. The things I thought were impossible. <laughs> the new uh, the new never routine. asked that. How about there? How about now? Yeah. At least, that, at least it's not like that crackle. Uh, you know, kind it of is thing. crackling. It's kind of crackling. Otherwise, yeah. I would just leave it. But I'm hearing it. Crackle. No, but I think. Well, I was saying like with. We, we, I'm sorry. You had the 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 plug halfway in, and I think uh, just an FYI. Yeah. This monitor here seems okay. 
Yeah. As far as I, he sounds okay through this as far as I'm concerned. Oh, is that right? So maybe it's oh, their uh, no. monitoring. No, because it was in my headphones also. Oh, no, no, it's, yeah, but monitor. his is a separate monitor. So yeah. yours oh. sounds great, huh? Well, then oh, so, so it's so my far. little headphone amp. No, I heard it give, crackling and I heard him out of one ear. So. No, I, well, so now it's back to normal, kind of. Beardy normal. In my headphones. It's as good as I get right now. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. Can we just accept yeah. that it as is back okay. to normal? It's way it sounded to me the whole time. All yeah. right. Well, great start. Well, All you, right. you solved the problem, Justin. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Solve problems. Glad there was a problem. <laughs> All right, today's show is brought to you by our good friends over at... Uh, Guitar at, Center. At, <laughs> uh, that's right. Quality products out of that. That's right. Uh, over at More Beer, of course. For years, the folks at More Beer have been leading the charge when it comes to cool and unique homebrewing equipment. Like the Robo Brew, the easiest way to brew all grain. Made from stainless steel, the Robo Brew allows you to make nine gallons of beer all in one vessel. From boil to mash to cooling, Robo Brew is truly self-contained. So if you're thinking about getting to all grain brewing, you should seriously consider the Robo Brew. Or uh, up your fermentation game with the all-new Fermentasaurus Plastic Conical. has a 9-gallon capacity a stainless steel stand, a sturdy butterfly dump valve at the bottom, and the best part is it'll hold uh, up to 35 PSI. Check out these awesome innovations and more over at morebeer.com. Saw so those more beer guys uh, here at the Hop Grenade um, a couple days ago. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, I haven't seen Chris Graham in a while. And uh, they were here saying farewell to one of their longtime employees. Got another job. So oh, everybody okay. stays at More Beer forever. It's a great place to work. So True. when somebody leaves, it's like a big thing. He's uh, been there like Ryan Bartos. Yeah. Ryan Bartos. Yeah. yeah, he just wow. left. Got another gig. Uh, stripping or something. Nice. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's more money. Wow. Slumming it. <laughs> yeah. And for 35. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's looking good, right? Uh, anyway, go check them out over at morebeer.com. We love them. On today's program, we've got Seismic Brewing Company. Andy Hooper's on the program. He's their brew, uh, brewmaster. Um, we got a couple beers of theirs to try. So we'll be talking to Seismic. And they're um, they're kind of leading some of the charges into sustainable brewing, which, oh, which we'll much. learn about. Um, and the cool thing about that, you know, of course, we've covered that before. But a lot of the innovations they're doing, they're attempting to make it affordable for smaller breweries to do the same. It's almost like a prototype thing they're doing. Yeah, yeah which is kind of different, of course, than, you know, breweries like Sierra Nevada and and others who are doing wonderful things, but on such a large scale that most brewers can't afford it. So we'll talk about some things like that and and the beers that they have. It should be be a good time. Mm So, yeah, good to be back in the country. <laughs> country. That's why you're out of, out of, out of country. Continent. I was, I, was wow. out of the, I was out of the country for a little while. All right. All right. Went and saw our friend Yan in Paris. Oh, yeah. Nice. Outland Brewery out Outland. there. They're, they're doing a good job. Did yeah. you get to make a beer with him? Or did you, yeah. No, you no, no nobody they, asked me I, for I, that. I, I think Outland it would be bar. where you they forced they. to make a beer with him. Because you don't want to make a beer with him. No, and no. they know that. So right. he's, he's a good enough <laughs> friend not to ask. Right. Because then I'd, ha- I'd be like, all right, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You know, get up early? Oh, oh, it's being disappointing. No, Yen's on my schedule. They don't start brewing until 10 o'clock or whatever, mm-hmm. so that's a good thing. Kim Shimke entering the studio now. Mm-hmm. Really? Bringing everyone oh, down. Oh. Hang out Hope with us. Don't, I think that more than once. Hope we don't mess up her mic, too. I feel like she was here <laughs> last time we were all here. She was. She only comes when I arrive. Now. <laughs> I had to fend off police activity at Concord Bart to get here. Really? So, yeah. Fend off? What did you do? <laughs> I mean, I sat on the train until they let us off. Wow. No. Uh, what was the problem? What did you do? They Were you escorted off the train? This activity, they had to shut down the station. No. What did you do? <laughs> That's always a pain in the ass. Yeah. I sat and uh, made everyone enjoy their time on the train. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Excellent. All right. All right. What do we got going on today? A uh, few announcements, and our announcements are brought to you today by Drake's Brewing Company. I love those Drakes guys. And uh, they got their Hapocalypse release coming up. H- Hapocalypse Day is Saturday, February 3rd from 1 to 5. Hapocalypse, of course, is their uh, like major IPA series. Um, so uh, from 1 to 5 on Feb 3rd, uh, it's the return of H- Hapocalypse Green Label Double IPA, Black Label Triple IPA, and uh, a hazy edition White Label Double IPA. Uh, bottles of each beer will also be there, except the uh, White Label. I don't think you'll be able to get that. Uh, admission is only 35 bucks, or you can get the VIP package for 125 which includes bottles, plus early entry at noon, and you get an hour of tasting then. So uh, the VIP packages are limited, so you're going to want to go check that out first uh, if you're in- interested in that. There's a free shuttle from San Leandro BART Station, so you don't have to drink and drive. We like nice. that. Um, go check it out. It's a, a rain or shine event. You can go to drinkdrakes.com and check out Apocalypse Day. And correct me if I'm wrong. That's a multi. Uh, 
there's other breweries there as well. It's a, it's a oh, beer you're right. Actually, it's uh, it's also an IPA festival. Yeah, so there'll be general. a bunch of other breweries pouring their, du- their double and triple IPAs as well. Yeah, they say they'll be super fresh, hard to find double and triple IPAs from over a dozen oh, of uh, Drake's favorite breweries, plus live music and food. Yeah, oh. So you can go check that That's out. It's a lot for 35. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, all right. Also, uh, next week's session will be live from Fort Collins. So those of you out in the uh, northern Colorado area can come hang out with me. We're going to be talking to the uh, Colorado State University Fermentation Science and Technology Program. Oh, man. I wish I could be there. Yeah, I'm excited about the directors coming in to talk about the program. The program's relatively new, actually. It's only, I don't know, three or four years old. Um, But he said that, you know, given their proximity to the Brewers Association and all these great craft brewers, they're just already really into integrated into the the pro beer scene so uh come hang out with me it'll be at 6 p.m mountain time at the uh, hop grenade fort collins i'll be there are you going no no <laughs> you just like to say things that don't matter <laughs> by there he'll be wanted, wherever he is i just wanted to respond well, well, yeah. well, yeah. say wherever you go there you are yes exactly there you go. yeah yeah uh, yeah, so come hang out with me. It'll be a good time. I'll be there. Great. <laughs> Everybody just say things that don't yeah. mean anything. Yeah. I, I won't uh, be there. Yeah, I, w- I won't either. I, I <laughs> breathe in. I breathe air. <laughs> Um, hey, also, Spring Brews Festival tickets are now on sale. Oh, nice. oh. It's our ninth annual Spring Brews Fest. It's Saturday, March 31st in uh, in Concord here. So fly in, or if you're local, come do it. It's a great festival. 60-plus breweries once again. And, uh, yeah, we're in full swing of the planning. we already got over 20 breweries confirmed, uh, breweries like Russian River and some of our favorites, uh, Rare Barrel. So you can just go to thebrewingnetwork.com. You'll see a big, uh, big giant picture right there of the spring bruce festival you can click on that and buy your tickets um get them now you know you never know when we're going to sell out so it may uh you know i got my as you know i have my finger on the pulse yeah of the bay area and it's really really popular really popular our beer festival oh my god yeah Yeah. people are really looking forward to people like it and we got a little jump on getting everything uh, out before they started complaining and asking where tickets are this year so (laughs) So like Uh, like us yeah. Um, so, yeah, Saturday, March 31st, last Saturday in uh, March, yeah. and we're looking forward to it. I just signed uh, one of our bands today. Oh. I got uh, this band that I've liked for years. Actually, I've seen them at different festivals, but I never booked them before because they play other festivals. I like to have people that don't do that. However, I thought the timing was perfect this year. I got this band called Petty Theft. It's a Tom oh, yeah. Petty cover band. Oh, oh nice. And yeah. they're great. Perfect. They're they're really they're, good at they it. They are. They're really good. Yeah. So I thought that would be just perfect. Perfect for our crowd, plus a little tribute to my friend. And well, I mean, yeah. I wish he was my friend, yeah. Tom Petty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Will there be an exception for JP the Second to come to the festival? I don't understand the question. The baby I thought, thing. I thought kids weren't allowed. But will we allow? Oh, JP are you going to have a baby by then? When is it? It's March thirty first. Maybe. When's your baby due? Twenty fourth of March. Oh, so oh, you he, don't take him outside. He's not even going to leave the house. You don't take but him outside. But he would come to the fest, right? I doubt it. Don't think you get not other shots first. Not if I don't have to. Um, <laughs> right. He has. He's always looking for an excuse oh, not right, to go. Right. That's a pretty good one. Wait, he gets maternity good. leave. <laughs> paternity, yeah. yeah. Sure. Or maternity. What? I'll take whatever. I don't right. any kind of leave. Give me a reason. My yeah. cat had baby. Um, no, you give them your... Yeah, yeah, they have... I don't know. The shots no, thing. We had a class. We had a newborn class. What, do you, what, is that, what does that entail? Yeah. So, like, through Kaiser, you sit... You, you go to the hospital, and you sit in some fucking conference room with, you know, 15 or 20 other expecting parents. Or awful. Like, couples. Wow. I don't know. And um, you watch videos, and you have a, a sheet, a printout sheet of, like, what to do when your kid is sick and all this kind of stuff. And you I just went to that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, Taryn wanted to go and I'm like, okay. And, um, so I just sat uh-huh. there and drew like cocks on the babies <laughs> and like mustaches. And it was like how to tell if your child is sick, it has a fever or, you know, it's, it's uh, crying a lot. And I just wrote act gay. <laughs> and I, so I send these, I just turned my sheet to Taryn and, and I just, my goal was to make her laugh. So everyone turned around and looked and it didn't happen. Uh, um, she didn't laugh. Yeah. So I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what the class entailed. So um, far, it's like seems like normal things. Like, how do you tell there's something no, wrong? No, no, the right. baby's baby crying. Book. It right. has a fever. Well, and there was yeah. a video of like how to how to give the baby how to take the baby's temperature where an infant <laughs> under a month old yeah. up, the, up the butt. Right. And they had this kid 
on the you know in the video on the table and I'm like oh man they're like not a gonna, real kid like a real kid yeah. oh, I'm like geez. they're not gonna they're not gonna do this to my boy they're not and they took the diaper off and there's a cock and I'm like they're not gonna do this to my boy lift his legs and I'm like yeah. oh they're doing this to my boy wow I didn't and I just I I fucking I just wrote oh, I think I'm dying <laughs> like I can't I couldn't hold it in yeah right. they could have just I laughed it, like you know yeah we all know what a butt looks like wait till yeah. you have to do it <laughs> well and wait, she's like how did happen. you graduate high school I'm like barely yeah because this is pretty much I got separated a lot from a lot of people. Right. You laughed out loud. Why am I learning? I, I snickered taken? real loud, and a couple people looked at me. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm, this idiot? And I want to tell him, I'm high, I'm 40. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Things going in butts is still funny. <laughs> of course it is. We have a very adolescent sense of humor, as everybody knows. So it's true. I'm surprised that Taryn would ask you to sit through that, knowing that the possible result well, is that. Did. Well, and then she, we're leaving. She goes, so the next class is the breastfeeding, oh, and I don't oh. think you're going to go to that with me. <laughs> right. Like, dang. I mean, why would you, anyway? Bro, that's what I keep telling her. I have no she interest at all. Buy only a perk, and then you yeah. can't go. <laughs> No. We never know what you might see. Did you guys figure out that baby's name yet? Not yet, no. Does that mean you have, but you don't want to say it? They don't know that baby's happen? gender yet. No, no, we don't know that. Oh, you're not going to know. Right? Well, yeah. we still got to pick a couple names, We still got to pick a couple yeah. names, So yeah. name it Chris is there, is there, or Pat. Pat. <laughs> How's the list doing? <laughs> um, the, well, okay, so we haven't made a lot of headway because we have her family coming over a lot, and yeah. so we basically write it down on the fridge. Um, okay. And then, you know, try to get, like, an idea board going. But we don't – the worst thing you can do is tell your family what names you're thinking oh, of. No, yeah. no, no, no. Because no. then they name it. Yeah, then they go, whoa, well, have you thought of – you know, your Aunt Gertrude was really nice. And you should, <laughs> no. I really – and they start they start telling you right. what they want to call yeah. it. And so we have to erase it every time and then put and it back forget. up. <laughs> and we forget. So now we just have to – we well, have to just do it. Well, let's go in the opposite order. What are the worst names that either you – or both you and Taryn have come up with that, that one of you had to reject? Uh, well, Taryn's okay. Taryn's grandfather's name was Clive. Okay, and I oh, said yeah. no. I don't. That's not a good. Was that a legitimate offer? Like yeah. she was like, "What about Clive?" Yeah, yeah. It was on the list. Okay, it was on the list. It makes yeah. a good middle name. Keeps people yeah, happy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, and my grandfather's name middle name was Weston, and she goes, "Oh, that's a good first name." And I go, "That's wow. a good middle name." A that's, good a middle name. <laughs> yeah, that's a hotel. There's also a hotel. <laughs> my baby will be five star baby, so it matches. <laughs> um, or she's his baby. <laughs> Uh, Alice, she kind of wants. I'm like, that's yeah. kind of blah. Or kinda old? Uh, no, it's old. She goes. It's almost. It's like Abigail. <laughs> yeah. Right, Bevo. You get mothballs. Best child in the world. <laughs> when the baby's born, is a packet of mothballs because um, that's what they're going to smell like. Yeah. Um, oh God, what was You're the other lucky. one? Um, Eustace, Agnes. <laughs> Eustace. Know, what, oh, um, she goes. I've always liked the the name Pamela. Ooh, Ooh. wow! How old is Taryn? <laughs> That's what I'm asking her. Those I'm like throwbacks. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. what are you? Are you like drinking like a tablespoon of vinegar every morning <laughs> That's too? So like, terrible. What is this? Also, for some reason, I just think of uh, silicone and Tommy Lee. Me <laughs> yeah. yeah. too. Right. Pamela. Strippers and meth. That's uh, what I, I thought of. I just think of old frumpy fifty five year old ladies with five cats. I am Pam. Yeah, I'm Pam. I'll be your driver today. <laughs> Ooh, what about Gretchen? Hi, I'm Pam. Can I take your order? <laughs> Would you like to hear our specials? Gretchen. No. no. Agnes. I knew one Gretchen, and she was a slut. So that will always forever be. <laughs> oh. I love of, how our brains work. I I we latch on to these things from our past, and if there's We're any human. sort of association, yeah, yeah. it could be a wonderful name or a wonderful thing, but it, you know, like a song, right? right? Best song ever. No, that bitch cheated on me during <laughs> no, that song. Sure, and, so. No, you wouldn't so, want to do that. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, I, will you, are you willing to give us one good one, even if it's, you know... Oh, in the maybe list. The maybe. Well, okay, so to, that, to the old lady name end... Uh, uh, my grandmother's name was Helen. Okay, I had a grandma Helen. <laughs> wow, we deaf. have like the same <laughs> family. <almost. laughs> and um, uh, I, that might happen. Okay. Uh, Linda That's an is old another one, one too. too. Helen it is, is yeah. you, but you're it's talking not, about Pam and stuff. Helen is old well, as shit. Pam isn't old, but Pam is like boring. It's like yeah. um, I don't know. It's getting. It's like painting your walls white. Beige. Everything's but, white or yeah. beige. Like, uh. But you want to party sure. with Helen? <laughs> right. Well, Helen at least Helen's has, coming over. I feel has a little yeah. more personality Helen to it. Helen sounds very sophisticated. It does. Taryn kind of. just texted me and said he's lying. She was joking about Pamela. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. not true, first of all. Yeah. I, I take Trying to Terry's save phone. She doesn't she have a phone get when I'm not around. I don't let I don't let her text while I'm not around. <laughs> That's Helen a rule Wheels. We um, so I was thinking Helen or Linda would be a good one. Yeah, okay. um, Helen Wheels. She said Lydia. 
Maybe Lydia. Lydia. Ooh, I, like kind of fun. I like that. What baby books are you guys looking at? I swear it's from 1976. <laughs> a lot of these are making comebacks, though. These right, are they? Names. Is that yeah. what's happening? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. everything's... You got, it's hipster books. Hipster book, babies. It? Oh, my God. Hipster, hipster babies. babies. No, because then it would be like Sage or something Helen like is, Helen is like, like <laughs> pre-Christ name. Like, that is a fucking old name. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not... You know what I mean? But... Right. Uh, Pre-Christ? <laughs> yeah. You're retarded. Yeah. No, I'm... It, what, Jesus' grandma was Helen. Yeah. No, I'm serious. It's a Greek name. It's what? an old Greek name. It's before before Jesus. No we knew what Christ you meant. Oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, yeah I wasn't confused. BC, she said before Christ, and she thought he was like Why don't you guys just make up something? Like all Gork. your own. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Gleepslob. <laughs> Demogorgon. Be the first to yeah. yeah. a city. Yeah. Like Jay Terrence. What about a nice brewery name, you know, like Glycol, like something random out of the... <laughs> Triclover. Uh, <laughs> which call it Clive's. Uh, Clive Triclover Petros yeah, has TC. a read to yeah. it, actually. And uh, if it's a boy, that shit will be a boxer. That's a boxing name. Yeah, that's true. Triclover! <laughs> Got my or money a stripper on name. Or, or a stripper name. Wow. I don't go to strip way. clubs, but I would go see a stripper called Triclover. I've Welcome to the day. I wonder be. what her trick is, because there's good something. There's something <laughs> Right. Uh, Three she's horses. got a tight grip. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, good luck. Keep us up to yeah. date. Uh, I will. I'll be excited to find out the name of the new Petros. Me too. Man. Okay. <laughs> Man. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, we still have some shirts on sale in the Brewing Network store, so you can go get a deal. We're almost out of stock on them. And there's a couple new shirts in there. Uh, at least two new designs are in there. Plus, we've got the Sour Hour shirts up in there. But you can still get 20 to 50% off a whole bunch of items. So go check it out. And then, um, yeah, I'm supposed to meet with our design company next week to talk about even more designs. So Excellent. get rid of some of those shirts so we can get you some new stuff. Um, you can keep doing your Amazon shopping uh, through our homepage. Just click the Amazon link. It says Shop Amazon right there. It's a great way to support us both in the U.S. and the U.K., and a lot of you do it. We appreciate it. Um, also, if you want to support us, subscribe and join the BN Army. Uh, just hit the donate button. You can do it a one-time donation or a recurring donation, and it puts you in the More Beer monthly donation giveaway, which is a chance to win $100. We give it away every month. So, um, yeah, support us. It's a great way to do it. All right, you can get uh, information and fun and different weird stuff that Kim posts over on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I like how those are three separate yeah. categories. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. No. Information, fun stuff, and, and shit things Kim that post. Posts, yeah. Um, how's, the, how's it going over in our social media world, Kim? Are you, are you still enjoying it? Am I still enjoying it, yeah. or are the people still enjoying yeah, I it? I guess it's a, it's a loaded question of both. <laughs> Uh, seemingly, yeah. the numbers keep going up. That's oh, good. Have, numbers, pretty huh? much, yeah. Right. Since uh, I, June will, June or July will be four years. I've been doing this for you guys. Wow, that's a long time. That is a the long numbers should have gone up. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I wasn't coming once a month then. So, so now more, that I've changed that, I mean, I'm more month, likely to coming? leave. <laughs> once out. every three. <laughs> I see. Uh, okay, I noticed you post recently a, a flashback, uh, JP and I's old uh, Christmas calendar photo. Yeah, that, that was, was nice. too good not to. That, that hurt. Nice. I feel good. like there needs to be more of those. Yeah, there are I there are too. more. My staff. No, I mean follows... we're gonna, we got to make some more. Is oh, what I'm okay. saying. Yeah. All right. Yeah. More more holiday photos. My hot grenade yeah. staff follows our social media much more than I do. I was at our company Christmas party and they were all walking around showing me that photo. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I need to see that shit. Right. Yeah. I, I was there, fool. <laughs> I texted JP. It's so perfect because it looks like your hair is supposed to be ironic, like you're doing it just for the photo. But that's actually, actually how you hair. wear your hair. Yeah, totally. <laughs> what you mean? Not you mean not gray? <laughs> it was not gray. Oh, it was that's, pretty dark. The only true. thing I had going for yeah. it when he was using his just for men. Yeah. I can't afford it anymore. <laughs> so you should be like Steven Seagal, <laughs> which is like what, what? Just a rapist? balding and dye the hell out of your hair so it's jet black. Uh, it could happen. Like one it's day. so uh, it's so obviously dyed that yeah. it's you know what I mean. Like Shoe it's almost black. purple. It's a good idea. That's where you should go with that. If I ever die, maybe I'll I'll start with that. I'll just go ridiculous first. I think you should. Yeah, uh, just before I shave it all off. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. All right, you can send feedback to feedback at thebrewingnetwork.com, and your show ideas can go there, too, and, and we read some of it on the air, and that's kind of fun. Once in a while. So, <laughs> all right, we have a Twitter game today? We do, yes. Great. Twitter games brought to you today by the Wine and Hop Shop. Go check them out. Uh, locally owned and operated for over 40 years. And if you use uh, coupon code BN Shipping in the notes field, you get $8 flat rate shipping on orders under 50 pounds. 
So use coupon code BN shipping. Most items ship within 24 hours, and it's the only place to get Wisconsin Hop Exchange and Gorst Valley Hops grown in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin was one of the top hop producing states in the union at one time. All AHA and local homebrew club members also get 10% off. Over 100 varieties of hops, over 100 varieties of yeast, and 75 over 75 types of malt, all fresh. 15 varieties of hop rhizomes when you get into the uh, growing season. And, of course, they are a Blickman Engineering retailer. Go check them out, the Wine and Hop Shop. What's our Twitter game today? Well, before the show, Justin, we were talking about tattoos. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, then I, I overheard uh, something coming in that Doc is finally going to get his first tattoo. Wow, and he was so opposed yeah. to them for his whole life. Right. Well, you know, look, <laughs> as you get older, <laughs> you start being a little more soft. <laughs> Yeah, right. Sure, a little so, soft in the brain. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like we need to come. We need to help him come up with ideas. Okay, he wants one desperately. He was yeah. like, "I really, really need a tattoo." Right, I was need always to be relevant. against them. Always so against them. So it's got to be really something that makes a statement. Okay. okay, how about this? It's gonna take really something to get me over the cliff. Right, yeah, right. right. Go move well, we're the gonna way. find that. We're gonna give you something. That's yeah. for sure. And like if a, I can just add to that, Doc had mentioned it's going to be a full back tattoo. Oh, so just oh. when you're thinking of oh. what it would be, it's an it's his whole big uh, right. canvas. Yeah, full big back canvas. tattoo. Okay. Well, okay, right. it's not that big because he's very tiny. That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. back though. <laughs> it's good. It's like strong back. <laughs> <laughs> Make it fit on a regular ass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tweet us your answer to what full back tattoo will Doc be getting? Um, okay. How about some feedback? Let's do it. Okay. Feedback's brought to you today by our friend John over at the Beer Law Center. You can go to beerlawcenter.com. He takes care of our trademark and can take care of yours, too. Plus, he put out a new program this week. Um, it's a beer consigliere program. I was reading about it. Uh, you can go check out details on that, but it's an affordable way to get uh, ongoing legal counsel from the best guy in the beer business. Beerlawcenter.com. All right, Paul writes in, a question for you guys. Hey, I have a one-gallon homebrewing setup, and I want to know, can I brew without boiling my wort? I would hop the wort, sparge, and then do a 30-minute or so hop stand into an ice bath. And then his secondary question is, if so, what style might I aim to do this? You can't not no. boil, I'll, right? You can do mead. <laughs> yeah. You should be happy yeah. with that. But make, not beer. Make cider. You have yeah. to make cider, make yeah. beer. Is, not, how long, not, well, made, okay. not beer. It's an all it's an all grain. You said sparge. I mean, it's I guess all, he said sparge. Yeah. Right. So no. So he would literally just sparge into and then add hops, but the hops you, have to be boiled, right? Also, the yeah. enzyme's got to be denatured. You can, you can, if you raise the mash temperature, you could denature the enzyme. And you got to yeah. boil off the the DMS. Right. Yeah. Uh, you got a lot of things to do there. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're doing all grain. Like, more beer has yeah. the no boil extract kits, I think. Uh, you could probably get okay. away with and that. You could get away with it, right. but yeah. wh- why would you? Extract has already been boiled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah right. So you're probably okay with that, but. But um, not all grain. And what kind of beer can he make? That's what he's asking. Shitty beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's only a gallon. Go for it. No, it was, yeah. <laughs> what about like a, that? What about like a gruit? I mean, but you still have oh, to denature nah, the enzyme. It's still not sanitary. So. You could and, either. Oh, yeah. Oh, you could get it up. Hold it above, you know, hundred. No, I guess you could pasteurize it. Hundred and sixty. You raise the pasteurize mission. it for a while. It'll be, it'll be sanitary. Mm-hmm. But you're not getting rid of all the other little, right. you know, okay. bad no, things. No, there's no so not, breaking yeah. the protein, yeah. proteins are getting breaking down. They can move yeah. right through the right. right. I wish this was a phone call rather than email because I want to know why, no, yeah, you, like yeah. why. Especially you if you it. have an all grain setup, you've already you're already going right. through all that trouble. Right. It's pretty easy to, you have do to the heat the water. water. Does yeah. he not have a stove? Oh, no. <laughs> well, he has one. to heat the water to do the math. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If I was a right. one-gallon brewer, I'd be trying all kinds of odd stuff, you know, because it's yeah, only sure. one gallon. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's where he's at. Well, you sure, make a good go point. Ahead. You can try it and yeah. see what it tastes like. But um, we're saying there will be a lot of issues. A lot of beer. issues, a lot of off flavors, a lot of things you wouldn't want in there. Okay. Yeah, a lot of uh, long You could probably chains. get away with a, you know, a nice, bigger, dark beer. Something that has a little melanoids in it, or, something like that. Hmm. Or a Belenervites. But I would ex- expect it oh, to okay. finish really high in gravity, so I wouldn't make a very big beer if I did it. Yeah, but I'm just saying something that's dark and uh, okay. got a lot of uh, melanoids in it, so you're not going to get well, a good. lot of the DMS coming through the well, stuff like yeah. that. Don't right. use those yeah. yeah. Okay. 
All right. Thanks for writing in, Paul. There's your answer. All right. Best we can do. All right. Zeb writes in. This is about JP's cat dying, which oh. I didn't know happened. JP, which cat? Wesley. Oh. The big man. What a bummer. Yeah. I had to put him down. That's a while back. You he had diabetes. Oh, really? Apparently. That's uh, that's terminal in cats, huh? Well, no. It is to hit with his. Uh, yeah, it is with my <laughs> pain. No, um, he, uh, apparently cats uh, won't, they're not as good as dogs are in telling you that they're sick. So when he, when he disappeared and I had to go drag his ass into the vet, they were like, he's, your cat needs to go to emergency room. Like, mm. this is not a healthy cat. Uh, but just the day before, he was just hanging out and, like, being a fat old bastard. So I see. Um, they were like, look, he's going to have to stay here for three days to fix his diabetes, and then we can help to determine what's wrong. I think he has liver damage. Mm. It's not going to be good. And, it, yeah, so we're like, well, okay, we just have to, mm. we have to put it down, unfortunately. It was bad. I'm sorry to hear that. It's a bad day, dude. I bet. Well, uh, Zeb writes in, um, I've been catching up on back episodes and was quite surprised by the ending of the November 27th episode. Imagine my shock. It turns out that JP does, in fact, have a soul. Um, all bullshit aside, it was very heartfelt discussion that hit close to home. I've had to put a couple of my own uh, best friend felines down in recent years, and it was always a raw, gut-wrenching experience. Uh, one thing that's helped me is commemorating the departed beasts via beer. Uh, one cat in particular, Molly, used to drink beer out of my glass when I wasn't looking, but only if it was good beer. If homebrew was off, <laughs> she'd turn her nose up at it. So I spent a lot of my brewing time the last couple years perfecting a pale ale recipe I hope would be worthy of her distinction. Palette. And I've managed to win a few regional medals with Miss Mall's Pale Ale and plan to continue to submit it to NHC and the California State Fair until it strikes gold. I even got my, at the time, six-year-old daughter uh, in the act as she created the label. Cheers and Ooh. keep up the good work and sorry for your lost jip yeah. from Zeb. It's all right. We're over it now. That's good. All right. Yeah, that didn't take long. <laughs> Wesley who? <laughs> right. Never heard of the guy. Well, I'll tell you this. You know what sucks now for the rest of your life is your fucking Facebook memories feed. Because I oh, yeah? swear to God. Oh, uh, yeah. The nine out of ten. And I'm, I don't think I'm exaggerating here. Nine yeah. out of the ten memories that p- that pop up in my feed yeah. are the biscuit. <laughs> every fucking day I gotta wake up to the biscuit in my feed, and it's just how do you turn that off? You uh, can't. Re- oh, you can. Yeah. Oh, I gotta do that. Yeah. I just thought, did I never take a picture of anything but my dog? <laughs> no. Uh, That's probably why people hit you on Facebook. <laughs> Fuck this dog again. Yeah. Here's a leaky vagina. Here's the thing. Well, so well, I don't know if you did that, but uh, welcome to a life of your fucking. Uh, Cat every morning on God. your Facebook feed. Yeah, it's not going to be good. One yeah. of mine came up last week. Yeah, one of your cats? No, no, it was one of those Facebook memory things. Yeah, yeah. It's me next to you in your hospital room when you had MRSA. That one oh. popped up too. So actually, of the nine out of ten, the tenth one is also some other fucking shitty moment in my life too. So either does this happen to everybody? Because either I've not had any good moments in my life, or at least didn't post about them, or the algorithm just picks the shitty times. Does everybody? Do you guys get happy moments popping up in yours? I think it yeah. only posts. Yeah. I think it posts all of the things that you posted that particular day. No, 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 no. It, it, picks. it just it picks one. one I think day. it's things that are like ta- that you spoke about a lot or tagged. It's like a word thing. My friend yeah, still gets stuff of her ex husband who asked her for the divorce, and Ooh. he comes up like their photos together come up. That's fucked up. She's like, doesn't it recognize that it said at one point married, and right. then that, that person's no longer on my relationship it status? Doesn't, but what it a, should. Yeah, what yeah. a terrible algorithm. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're trying to remind you of the bad times. So you can be like, well, my life's way better <laughs> no, now. <laughs> so. It's pretty yeah. ingrained in there. Yeah. I'm good with that. Remember that yeah. time I lost 235 pounds of <laughs> shit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember yeah. how fat you used to be? <laughs> It's awful. Yeah. Well, yeah, welcome yeah. to your Let's new get life. Get away with that. Yeah. Well, thanks. Turn that <laughs> so far, everything's been great. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> the terrible musicians write in. Um, <laughs> All of them? The low bar. Dear Brewing Network, uh, JP, you will love this as our feedback will be shortened to the point. Or maybe not. We'll okay. see. All right. As an observation, we noticed that Justin's departure from the show conveniently coincides with hiring Bevo on full time. We aren't saying that you're not doing a good job, but how do you think you would be doing if Bevo wasn't there? I'm sure the BN would be fine. I'm sure Justin would agree because he's lazy. Um, so, let's see. JP, do, do, do. Uh, all right. So uh, before I move on, that's the first question I think for you, JP. Yes. How do you think you would be doing if Bevo wasn't here? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, you're getting it's a non-issue. Oh, yeah. she, uh, produces, Don't turn around. No, produce this show. Doesn't she do some of the yeah, but, dirty work? But you I, could do I it mean, yourself if you had. To. Yeah. We might get a few less tacos. Yeah. If she true. wasn't around. Yeah. I just order pizza. Oh. <laughs> yeah. The breaks would be a little longer while I got the beer. It'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Bevo, you have no effect on JP's life. None at all. <laughs> well, don't leave yet. I Bye. That's only JP's answer, <laughs> not mine. Leave when he's here on his own. You want your check? Um, <laughs> That's the law. All right. No, I do that myself. I can take you're care of it. You, <laughs> Second question. So, yeah. JP, who do you plan on choosing to replace you? Because you must be exhausted subbing in for some guy who can't be bothered showing up for work. <laughs> Yeah, so. uh, to okay. replace oh. me, Kim. Kim Shimke. Yeah, I would. I put in a vote a for Shimke. Yeah, yeah. only because so it would piss off everybody else in the room. <laughs> It'd be great. <laughs> but I wonder if our uh, if our accusations of being sexist would uh, would go up or down with Shimke at the helm. Well, probably up because um. I'm the only time that you guys had people like actually write in saying that you were highly offensive. Right. When I did the I did a post. I think. Oh, that's true. You were the biggest sexist in in the room. Apparently, or, yeah. I think at least they would be justified. I don't know. <laughs> with ours, they're not. Uh, well, this question is appropriate because he's going to be with child soon, which means he's not going to be here. He'll be with child. Yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, many yeah, yeah we the baby will be born. Yeah, but you need the job. Tell me about leaving because you have a no, baby. no. I need the I job. I feel like my only saving grace is JP needs a job. Yeah, right. so yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. Yeah, also, yeah, yeah. Let's but how be long is maternity? Let's be leave. fair. You're gonna need to get the fuck away from that kid for a minute. Well, yeah, because I, especially because I work from home. Yeah, and so yeah. when Taryn is done with maternity leave, she's gonna go back to work. Wow. I mean, it'll be extended because um, her her boss is real cool, and she'll get to work from home as long as she's able to uh, right. has work to do. Right. Mm-hmm. So it'll be a little bit longer than the standard maternity leave. Um, but, but then basically, you're going to be like, stuck with her and the kid, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. a lot. You won't be able to work from home. And then you're, you're not going to be, be here. Cafe. And we're all screwed. Well, yeah. I haven't thought about the plus side of this. I might get to leave more, because you're going to be begging me to do shows. I, I need to can do I work. please do? How about we do the session twice a week? <laughs> you're going to be just dying to get out of there. So this could, well, this could work out to my benefit. It could. Yeah, it definitely could. Well... <laughs> They go on to say, we love what you're doing, but we miss the old days. Uh, Uh, So we just want to say, suck it, JP. And Bevo, you are wonderful and keep doing what you do. So, sincerely. Thank you. I'm glad somebody appreciates me. Sincerely, (laughs) actually, the terrible musicians. All right, good feedback. And finally, this one is about our new show about to launch here on the Brewing Network called Heads and Tails. I ain't never um, heard of it. That's JP and Beardy's new show about distilling. Uh, Ryan wants to know, is this on Apple Podcast yet? From Ryan, uh, it is not yet. We're at, you guys have a couple of shows ready to go. Yeah. We're just waiting on a couple final uh, sponsor details before mm-hmm. we put them up in iTunes. But we're hoping you might see them as early as next week, right? Uh, I'm hoping this week. I'm hoping later this week. Okay. We'll see. There. Uh... Well, even if we if we publish to iTunes this week, it could take until next week for oh, them to it. appear. Mm, got it. But if you are just dying for the show. Um, They'll they'll probably be up on the website later this the, week. Yes, uh, so you can That's download directly from the website. Um, it just the the feed won't be in iTunes just yet because right. we have to submit it and then approval. And, and I'll tell that. you, it's a pretty good show. Yeah, and I don't often say that about things that I do. Right, right. and I'm <laughs> even on it, <laughs> even with Beardy on it, even with Beardy. On Are you three or four in? Th- uh, four. Well, we're we Americans, so we're not foreign, but we have three. We have four done. Yes. How yeah. many are you going to launch this month? Three. Three of the... So okay. Three three episodes in January, and we have February's done. Excellent. Um, February's was with uh, Rogue Spirits. Oh, cool. Um, nice. Yeah, and uh, good stuff. Yeah. Having a good time. Great. Yeah. All right, so there you go. That's our feedback today, of course, brought to you by Beer Law Center. All right, before we take a break, here's what you can do right now while you're waiting for the commercials to end. Go to Beersmith.com and download your free 21-day trial of their awesome brewing software. You can use it as a home brewer or a pro brewer. It's really great stuff, and it works on a a PC or a Mac. Tons of video tutorials over there to learn all of the different features that are offered. And you won't regret it, but if you do, it's just a free 21-day trial anyway. But um, I pretty much can guarantee, I'd be surprised if anybody doesn't actually end up 
than just buying the software after the oh, 21 day trial. Yeah. I've really never heard your... of anybody go, oh, damn it, this software doesn't do the other one thing I need it to do. Oh, it's too convenient. Yeah. Right. If you use it, you're going to like it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Go to beersmith.com and you can uh, check it out over there and get your, get your free trial and um, all oh. that fun stuff. Okay. I'm going to figure out how to use my software again. Yeah. Push a button. Yeah. There we go. Soft. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are talking to Seismic Brewing Company. We got Andy Hooper on the air. We're going to talk about uh, Seismic Beer and have ourselves a good time. Hang in there. It's the session. Listening to the Brewcasters. Brewcasters on the Brewing Network. Are you a member of the White Labs Customer Club? If not, you should be. It's the easiest way to earn free stuff for turning in your old homebrew labels from either vials or pure pitch. All you have to do is save your labels and redeem them for things like free yeast, an exclusive White Labs t-shirt or sweatshirt, and even the opportunity to brew with the yeast man himself, Chris White. Signing up is easy. Just go to whitelabs.com slash customer club, fill out the registration form, and then mail in your labels. They will return the favor by sending you awesome White Labs. Labs swag. Go sign up today at whitelabs.com slash customer club. White Labs, pure yeast and fermentation since 1995. The 21st Amendment. Watch out! Do you like beer? They make beer. Watch out! Do you like friends and fun? They make friends and fun. Watch Do out! Do you still like to have a good time? The 21st Amendment. Watch out! The 21st Amendment in San Francisco, located at 563 2nd Street, two blocks from the building where baseball is seen and played. Try their beers in the pub or try them in the can. Featuring... Monk's Blood. Made with real monk. Watch out! So why not have the best time of your life? Go to the 21A and Sean O'Sullivan will personally greet you with a can of... Monk's Blood. The 21st Amendment. Watch out! This advertisement is not in any way affiliated nor associated with the 21st Amendment Bar and Pub, nor its subsidiaries or affiliates. This telecast is not copywritten by the 21st Amendment for the private use of the Brewing Network. Any use of this telecast without Jamil Zanishev's consent is prohibited. Suck it, JP. Brewing great beer is a process of continuous learning, and the best books on every aspect of brewing can be found at Brewers Publications, with more than 50 awesome titles like Modern Homebrew Recipe, by Gordon Strong. Designing Great Beers, The Ultimate Guide to Brewing Classic Beer Styles by Ray Daniels. American Sour Beers, Innovative Techniques for Mixed Fermentations by Michael Tonsmeyer. For the Love of Hops, The Practical Guide to Aroma, Bitterness, and the Culture of Hops by Stan Hieronymus. And Radical Brewing, Recipes, Tales, and World-Altering Meditations in a Glass by Randy Mosher, plus many, many more. These are the books and the authors with the knowledge to push your brewing farther than you thought possible and you'll find them all at fine homebrew and book retailers everywhere and visit the website at brewerspublications.com brewers publications all the best on beer and brewing Marin Brewing Company in Northern California has been making award-winning beers for more than 25 freaking years. Today, I want to tell you about their new 12-ounce cans of Mount Tam Pale Ale. The good stuff, Mount Tam is bright gold, 5.5% ABV to keep you feeling good, and has been winning awards since 1989. If you're visiting the Bay Area, get your butt out to Marin Brewing Company. They pour tasty beers and serve great food every day until midnight. Come in for a tour, stay for the food, and pick up... A six-pack of cans of Mount Tam Pale Ale to enjoy at home, camping, biking, or whatever the hell you do. Owner Brandon Moylan has this to say about Marin Brewing Beers. It's freaking awesome. Marin Brewing has won more than 100 gold medals in international competitions. Check out MarinBrewing.com for all their award-winning beers, food, and merch. Marin Brewing Company in Larksburg, California. Award-winning taste, refreshing finish. It's freaking awesome. This is Corey King from Side Project Brewing, and you're listening to the session on the Brewing Network. There's murder all around you. 
All right. Welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. we got Seismic Brewing Company on the program tonight. Uh, before we get to that, I just wanted to remind you to go check out our friends over at GreatFermentations.com. Great Fermentations has the largest catalog of Blickman products on the web, and their staff some of the best trained in Blickman products. They offer top-notch customer service and same-day shipping on many items. Go check them out at GreatFermentations.com, and be sure to like them on Facebook, GR8 Fermentation, Instagram, and Twitter. Great Fermentations, great supporter of this program, so please go support them. All right, as I said, we've got Seismic Brewing Company on the program with us today. Mr. Andy Hopper, the brewmaster, is with us. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being in here. Where's Seismic located? Where'd you come from? Uh, Seismic Brewing Company is located in uh, Santa Rosa, California. Oh, you are? Okay. So not too far. Um, Any effect from the fires up there? Are you guys okay through all that? We were lucky. You were? Um, Okay. We were very lucky. Uh, Our crew uh, is unscathed. Uh, There were some close calls. Okay. uh, Some... Some minor property loss, but everybody did very, very well despite uh, the tragedy. And did you have to shut down production for a time, or we did? Yeah. Um, we didn't need to. We did out of uh, sensitivity to people's struggles and, and uh, you know their their dislocation, things like that. So um, sure. you know, if if we absolutely had to, we could have kept the shop running. But it actually ap- acted as a uh, as a sort of uh, safe haven for a few folks. Uh, it was nice. home to a couple of people and their pets for wow. for a while. Yeah, yeah. Because I imagine your p- employees all live locally, and so some yeah. of them must been a- have been affected in, in that way. Um, okay. Well, I'm glad to hear you guys were okay, um, and uh, production I assume is back up and running and doing great. Yeah, full swing. Okay, excellent. So, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Andy. Uh, how'd you get into craft beer uh, brewing, and, and a little bit about your history there? Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, craft brewing, craft wine making, um, cider, mead, all that kind of stuff has been sort of a, uh, a hobby for a long period of time. Uh, I can blame my local uh, you know, close family members for getting me into that. Um, you know, primarily being, of course, being my mom and dad who uh, were growing hops and homebrewing beer. And, oh, nice. Yeah, passed it on to me, which is really cool. Uh, and then also my you know, uh, uncles who were uh, big into homebrewing beer uh, okay. in the late 80s, early 90s. So I absorbed it, uh, I guess, subconsciously. Uh, <laughs> and where did you grow up that they were growing hops? I'm curious. Uh, so actually, my uh, the first house that I can remember we grew hops was uh, up in uh, Auburn. Okay, uh, nice. Uh, border of Auburn and, uh, and Grass Valley, which is pretty... I don't know, maybe not the best growing environment, that red clay soil up there. Right. Northern California, for our listeners, is just about, I don't know, two hours north of where we are here in Concord. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. We're uh, known as the, uh, the the Foothills town that has that uh, In-N-Out burger on your way up to go see the game. <laughs> oh, yeah. Been oh, yeah. there more than a dozen times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On your way to Tahoe. That's there you right. Go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so your family kind of got you into it. Did you brew with them, like, as a kid, too? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got the opportunity to, uh, to observe a lot of brews when I was younger, and then uh, at one point, uh, somebody, I don't know who, uh, probably my dad, asked for my opinion, which was a, a shocker, right? <laughs> <laughs> First time dad ever gave a shit about your opinion. Right, right. <laughs> you can do four pints of that, I'll tell you. <laughs> What's your name? One for the record books. Yeah, um, nice. Yeah, and then, uh, I don't know, I, uh, it was always just sort of a hobby in the background. Um, okay. So through... Uh, through undergrad, um, you know, my uh, my undergrad was uh, biochemistry, and um, you know, you go one of a very short, limited number of places with that sort of a degree. It's uh, pharmaceutical research or or pre med or something like that, and I did not have the uh, patience, <laughs> grades, or ambition to do that. So, okay, yeah. um, you know, when I really, narrow pathway, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Uh, but when I realized that you know um, there were um, courses and programs that would legitimize a brewing career, yeah. I, I had an aha moment and was like, "This is for me." And just out of curiosity, what year are we talking then? Yeah, uh, it's about. Um, it's about 2006, okay. 2005, yeah. So when craft beer was really starting its, I don't know, second or third takeoff again. So it, it, it also made sense that it, it could be a viable career at that time. It, uh, it it did up until the point where I graduated and was in the job market. And then uh, if you recall, you know, late 2008, 2009, that was probably the yes, absolutely the worst time okay. to try to be a brewer looking for a job. Sure. Uh, so. What school did you go to? Uh, undergrad was Cal Poly, okay. uh, and then my um, brewing school was at UC Davis. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, do you hear that? Yeah, I do. I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying to figure out why this weird noise Something is coming JP from. JP did. <laughs> Whatever you just muted, Bevo, worked. I didn't mute anything. Okay. 
Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll edit okay. all this out, Andy. You're still going to sound great. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got your work cut out. <clears throat> By the way, I'm lying. I'm way too lazy to go <laughs> yeah, back yeah. and edit this out. <laughs> I just it. put so, it up so, as it is. So finally, you did get a job. Where did you start? Uh, the um, so I had actually uh, my my breakout you know into you know foot in the door shall we say uh, in craft brewing was uh, while I was still in college down at Southern Oh, oh so you already so. had some experience, but yeah, yeah. The week I turned twenty one, I, I I walked into a place uh, a little hole in the wall called Central Coast Brewing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we love those guys now. <laughs> yeah. Man. yeah, yeah, absolutely. George, huh? uh, they have uh, they've really turned a corner. It's a it's a pretty remarkable brewing uh, yeah. brewing company making some really good beers. Um, at the time they. Uh, uh, they were dumb enough to hire me, and so <laughs> got it. You know, I, I got to be a bartender slash brewer slash keg cleaner, do whatever is required, sure. and uh, simultaneously was able to uh, lock down a uh, an internship at Firestone Walker. Oh, so our nice. other one of our other favorite <laughs> California yeah. breweries. Okay. Yeah, so you know, 2007 was a pretty auspicious uh, moment in my career, being able to go from very small starting out brewing company in my shift there and go up and you know and bartend and give tours for a very very large very well renowned brewing company sure great reputation oh absolutely yeah did you get to end up brewing at firestone as well uh, i got to watch okay. and, and shadow <laughs> everywhere i possibly could and, yeah and i was that's every, enough really no, i was the intern yeah. Yeah. No insurance. yeah i was every ounce the annoying intern that was constantly asking to shadow and what's this what's that yeah good thing to do you know the annoying questions that the uh, the more tenured brewing Brewers, I'm sure, were really annoyed about. But, uh, <laughs> right. You know, it was great. It was a foot in the door, and there were some really nice folks there that, you know, okay. made me right. All right. And I, I saw in your, your background a little bit that you – did you end up at Anderson Valley Brewing Company at some point? Yes, yeah, so that's post-brewing school. Um, okay. Post-brewing school, like, like I was uh, referencing, was a, um, uh, it was 2009. It was a terrible time to be looking for a brewing job. Um, you know, I did a road trip out to uh, Durango, Colorado to take a – you know, I'm, I'm, you know, try to well, try my hand at taking a minimum wage job uh, as a sellerman, and um, didn't even get that. And really? So yeah, it was it was it was bleak. Okay. Um, the you guy, had a great credential from David. I mean, really, that's a good. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, and and so that speaks volumes to just no, the demand, just yeah. how terrible the the craft brewing industry that was the hop glut yeah. and lots of other things going on. But anyway, yes, I I, uh, I ended up um, getting a uh, uh, an entry level job or at least i thought it was at anderson valley brewing when i turned uh, out for my first day of work it turned out they wanted me to um to take over their quality lab okay <laughs> i thought i was interviewing to be one of <laughs> yeah, okay. many i had no idea i was i was naive i thought i was going to be one of a few you know lab technicians turns out they wanted me to build their qa lab wow. in the wake of somebody who had recently quit um no. and that's based on your your biochemistry uh, degree and background i assume or yeah, presumably yeah. Well, yeah. Covered to Davis too. take a lot of mileage out of that yeah, yeah i mean sure. for reference this is back when ken allen owned the place okay um and so you know uh a little bit different time in the you know the evolution of uh, Anderson Valley Brewing, but uh, yeah, they brought me on uh, to sort of bring back their their QA lab, and you know, being out in the middle of nowhere, the laboratory for Anderson Valley also had the responsibility of freshwater treatment from the ten oh, wells that they have that produce all their water, as well as wastewater treatment, right? Because uh, there's no municipal right. you know water supply or or sewer or anything like that. That's a big jump uh, into that position. Yeah. That's a lot of responsibility. I was terrified. I'm not. Really? I'm not going to lie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I assume they had they had some sort of uh, manual of procedures that they wanted you to take over and perfect, or were they like, uh, "Here you go, help us out"? Um, there really wasn't a whole lot of guidance. Okay. Um, I, you know. Uh, there's there's thrown to the wolves and there's a couple of steps above that and um, you know that that's fantastic because uh, I was just a couple of steps above thrown to the wolves yeah. and you know they gave me a, a lot of rope and luckily I didn't hang myself with it. Nice. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean it sounds like a great challenge though too. I I, I too would be terrified, but um, you must have learned a lot and, and able to really expand your uh, brewing science knowledge through that. Absolutely wonderful uh, learning experience. Um, trial by fire really. There were some things that I really had probably no business um being involved in but okay. you know it was uh it was troubleshooting and and learning things exploring things and um uh you know challenging the norm yeah when you know any any brewery i'm sure there's a lot of people you know who uh, who have been in the same um situation where you're working for a brewery who's been established for 20 30 40 years you know, you know yeah. who knows um and you get the phrase that's how we've always done it <laughs> right <laughs> 
And your your biggest challenge as a, an outsider, somebody with some critical distance, is challenging that phrase. Mm-hmm. That's how we've always done it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And how long were you there? Uh, six years. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did you work with uh, the Fal Allen, uh, the brewmaster, uh, during your tenure there? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, Fal had actually been there um, for, I think it was five years, and then he left for Singapore for a period of time. That's right. Um, when I was hired on, Fal actually wasn't there. Um, they had sort of dissolved the uh, position of brewmaster. And okay. So there was a... Uh, there was a general manager and there was a production manager. There was no brewmaster. I see. Um, and so after about eight or so months of uh, my working there, there was an announcement that um, the new owner had um, restructured and had rehired the the original, the OG brewmaster. It was all kind yeah. of you know, exciting for everybody that um, yeah. you know, it was a little bit of a, a throwback, which was, which was pretty cool. The announcement that uh, Fowl was going to come back from Singapore and make this big debut back into uh, <laughs> Northern California. Right. Um, well, yeah. if I remember right from our interviews with him, he's a very scientific brewer as well. So it seems like you two would have worked uh, really closely and, yeah. and gotten to learn even more. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, yeah, Fowl's a classic like, uh, author, you know, uh, they call him the rock star of brewing, and, and basically that stems from, you know, the fact that he did all these uh, all these little like papers and, and seminars, and he was very active, uh, you know, in, as, in terms of the educational aspect of the brewing community. Yeah, um, lots and lots of recognition from a lot of folks, mm-hmm. um, and that definitely uh, was impressed upon me. And, you know, in the first couple months we worked together, you, you couldn't follow him through, you know, the, the the GABF, for example, right? Without him recognizing everybody in the room and having <laughs> yeah. worked with them on some project or. Another, so yeah, no, he yeah, paid it cool. forward back in the day for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Okay, so fast forward to Seismic. When did you start there? And, and give us a little background in the brewery, uh, the Genesis story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, it it all, all credit has to go to um, the owner and my respective uh, wives. Because okay, they are how we got connected. Got it. So, um, Christopher Jackson, owner, president. Um, his wife, uh, Ariel, and my wife, Danica, knew each other in college. Okay. And um, so, uh, you know, Ari was very, uh, you know, familiar with my, you know, brewing passion and my, my, my education history and all that kind of stuff. Um, having lost touch with Ari for a number of years, um, uh, my wife and, and Ari uh, reconnected and had the conversation, hey, what, you know, what's new? What's going on? Oh, by the way. Uh, my husband wants to start a brewery. Does yours still have involvement in the brewing industry? Nice. Um, and that, you know, really inauspicious um, sort of, you know, introduction. She was like, nah, he's like doing wastewater treatment uh, somewhere yeah. up in Boonville. I don't know where it is. Yeah, yeah. He's in this, like, uh, population of thousands. Sanitation department. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that's entirely accurate. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so the introduction was made, and um, I started to get, uh, you know, I was, I was surprised at the story. Um, you know, Christopher and his roommate from college uh, at Santa Clara uh, had discussed trying to put together a, a craft brewery and you know I, I i will i'll be honest when when i heard oh there's some interest in these two guys that went to college together mm-hmm. you know, they, they want to pick your brain about opening a craft brewery i i took that with a gigantic grain of salt oh so I was yeah like, who and their college buddy doesn't want to open a craft <laughs> right. Brewery? Right. everybody right during Throw a rock yeah during the middle of the boom and everything else um but then after having you know met christopher um there was a lot of uh, detail that he, that he put on that, um, and I could tell he was serious. What's his background? So when I met Chris, he was uh, he was still in school at Berkeley okay. uh, for uh, law. Okay, and so you know his um, his interest in this whole project was purely from an entrepreneurial you know you know business standpoint that uh, he wanted to take the fundamentals that he had learned from you know his recently late father on the wine side and hmm. apply them to craft brewing, which. I, you know, I thought it was incredibly you know noble and really really cool um and the uh, the sustainability component came from uh, a number of conversations that he had had with his roommate patrick delves so the the, the two of these guys came to me with uh really just this really um uh, there, not a whole lot of texture to the concept but we want to start a craft brewery and we want this to be a sustainability focus okay awesome and it turned out through a couple more conversations that they they had some business savvy and they they had some 
you know, they had some Money. ambition. They, they, they definitely, uh, yeah, they had the wherewithal to go out and get the capital, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but really not a whole lot of, uh, you know, technical or, or operational savvy, which is where I came in. So mm-hmm. it, it, it began with, you know, I'll give you guys a couple of pointers, and then it came to, well, do you want to help us specify some equipment and – it grew organically from there to the point where Christopher said, "You know, you want to just you want to just do this, you know? <laughs> nice, yeah." Uh, which was really really cool um, because the the opportunity to uh, you know dive into a project um, ground zero, yeah. ground zero, and really plan it out. Uh, a lot of breweries, n- through no fault of their own, uh, lack the ability to uh, see full vision sure you know some definition on he- here is where we are and here's exactly where we want to be okay they they grow it organically let's see where this turns out and seismic was still somewhat that way um but there was also a little bit more texture to it okay you know, let's let's grow sustainably and let's not be the next mega craft brand that gets you know picked off by ab or constellation or whatever else because that was um you know to my delight one of the conversations that happened very early. Okay. I'm not looking to build a place and sell it to some mega. I want to own this long term. And, and what year was this <laughs> happening? This is two short years ago. Okay. Mm-hmm. So very quick. And yeah. from a sustainability standpoint, your resume is already helping you out, too, because Anderson Valley, at least on the water side with the water treatment plant and the reclamation, I don't know if they were doing even more with solar, but you were very familiar with sustainable brewing on that side already. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um it's uh, it's another trial by fire when you work for a brewery that um, has to not only literally dig all their water out of the ground to <laughs> yeah, brew with, yeah. but not only that, you have to use it wisely or else you shut the place down. <laughs> you know, you got to use it wisely, and then when you're done with it, you have to treat it to a, a point where uh, it's okay to you know discharge it mm-hmm. in some way, whether it's uh, surface irrigation of crops or you know dumping it into a lo- local waterway hmm. uh, both of which were strategies that we employed uh, uh, you know that all of that was in place before i got there i know i can absolutely take no credit for that but um it was a uh, it was an incredible ability to you know dive in head first on sure. you know onto a project that was that was in, in need of some attention and um so i, I got lots and lots of good experience trying to figure out how to use water very yeah, wisely save water yeah yeah and make some really great connections in a in a, in a growing industry of brewery wastewater treatment that, nice. was, that was a non-issue i'm sure 10 years ago sure now it's a hot button so seismic then brings you on as brewmaster right away yeah uh, and as a partner as well or no no, no. um as, as brewmaster founding member okay um, excellent and, uh you know when you when you're in uh in Christopher's position, um, there's no need to go out and, and source private equity or, or any of this kind of thing. So, um, okay, you know, I was I was given a choice to come on, and uh, you know, he's he's got me. He's going to listen to this later. He's like, oh my god, <laughs> yeah. he's got me. You know, give this guy an opportunity to build uh, a craft brewery from the ground up in exactly the way that any brewer would really want to envision it. With yeah, efficiency and cleanliness, hygiene in mind. Um, it was just, it was too tempting. Had to do it. Had yeah. To do it. yeah. I'm That's always excellent. excited about hearing about the result. I mean, you know, yeah. here you are, you know, ground zero. Yeah, yeah. What well, let's, you done? Wait, take, right. let's do that now. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some sustainability after the break, but we do have a beer in our glass, um, and it is our, what is it, the Shattered Cone IPA, yeah. I believe. So tell us about this beer. Our listeners are all home brewers and pro brewers, so you can be as technical as you like. We're always interested in the recipe and sure. uh, you know fermentation, just whatever you can tell us about the beer. Absolutely. Um, well, Shatter Cone is, is, is near and dear. Uh, we did a fair amount of recipe development, and uh, we worked on a, f- a few different um, you know, recipe ideas. And this is actually one that came uh, after most of that, you know, the bulk of recipe development had been done. It was an itch I needed to scratch, uh, and so we did, a, we did a pilot version of it, um, and we realized we were onto something. So... Um, the, the fundamentals of this beer, it, it's it's a two-row base, of course, but there is also uh, 30% Golden Promise, which is a favorite malt of mine. It sure. just has this, um, the French would say, I don't know what. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then, of course, that is all a blank canvas for letting the hops shine through, which I think is really important um, if, if the malts are, are detracting in any, any way. 
you've missed the point. Mm. So clean, very clean, uh, but substantial malt base to let way for what is a, a balanced bitterness. Um, I, I get a little bit of, an, annoyed when uh, when IPAs, especially when they're um, you know marketed as a single IPA, mm-hmm. is 100 and whatever IBU. Come on, <laughs> come on. This this is what I think is the magic number of about 55, hmm. 55 IBU um, to let way for some flavors and aromas. Yeah, right. So surprise, America hasn't kicked you out for that. It's that fifty five is the new pale ale, isn't it? It's so too reasonable. That, uh, is an unpopular <laughs> statement. Yeah. yeah, I know. As yeah. soon as I leave the booth, I'm, I'm going to get no. We're fans. You're hung, talking. drawn, and quartered. But uh, yeah. emails. Yeah, maybe out problem. there. In here, you're safe. We're fans. Yeah. All right, so, among uh, friends. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Um, well, so so the three hops uh, that uh, really take the stage on this are uh, really cool in my mind. Uh, so it's a blend of two uh, Pack Northwest hops. Um, and so this is Idaho 7, which is growing in popularity. But at the moment, uh, there's less than 105 acres, soon to be about 175 acres or so uh, in the world, which is cool to say that we're using it on a, a major uh, flagship of ours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other hop is Belma, uh, oh, yeah. and I am a yeah. not secret at all fan of Belma. It's a fantastic hop that's uh, grown in Mabton, okay, in the Yakima Valley. I've never heard of it, but JP, I think you should put it on the baby name list. <laughs> yeah, no. Belma. Yeah. Yeah. Belma. I, look, I looked at Doc, and he's like, "Name? Yeah, that's not gonna be, no. No. Yeah. Belma." You know, I don't. I, you know, not to give away all my you know secrets or anything, but Belma is another one that's uh, you know sub hundred acres. In, in the world. Um, this is one that uh, a local to Mabton uh, family discovered growing wildly up the side of one of their uh, harvesting facilities. Wow. So this was a, a hop that was hardy enough to withstand the worst conditions. Hmm. And uh, being the pioneers that they are, uh, God bless them, they planted five acres and then grew it from there. Nice. It, it turns out that it was a, uh, a cross... Oh, I hope I got this right. Of Magnum and Kitamidori. Okay. Kitamidori is a Japanese varietal. Magnum, of course, is the you know the bittering variety we all know. What a random occurrence. They grow neither. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> really? Wow. How those genetics get onto their property? Uh, oh, they will probably tell you all kinds of like some farmer came by with yeah, different right. stories. Dust all over him or something. I have no idea. Well, I have no idea. But interesting. Um, mm. Prospectors. What's important is that it it uh, it thrived, and among home brewers, it, it gained a little bit of traction. Amongst pro brewers, it gained a little bit of traction, but no one person hmm. has really um, brought it on. How would you describe its characteristics? Tuscan melon and strawberry. Okay, it's a very fruit forward hop. It is a medium high alpha at about ten to twelve, depending on the harvest year. Okay, um, so it you know it, it's got substance. And do you use it as a bittering hop with its magnum characteristics or not? No, no. Okay. Um, most of our our, our uh, hoppy beers thematically are bittered to a very minimal amount uh, in the kettle, and mm-hmm. we rely on almost all of our IBU pickup from the whirlpool. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're trying to retain as much of that you know nice delicious hop aroma flavor mm-hmm. resin content uh, without evaporating it all right sure. at the uh, the steam stack which i think you're doing in this case this is a very aromatic IPA. and very flavorful too right yeah. Yeah. nice hot flavor well, do you guys pick up the strawberry i get lemon lemon i definitely get the melon and that's probably is the melon yeah me too yeah melon also, I feel like there's just a like a, it's a touch of pine in there too, mm-hmm. but, but not that third. like danky thick kind, which yeah. it, which I like too. But here it's it's subtle enough that it's it's just almost a perfect touch of pine. A little resiny, a little even yeah. a little hint of a like the diesel quality that you can kind of get in some hops too. But just, the just a bit. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. That's the seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Idaho seven. Yeah, O seven is uh, is notoriously uh, big. I mean, it depends on the crop year and everything, but it can definitely come across as uh, you know as that OG. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Almost a little bit of sulfur, but you know, in a almost a pleasant way. Um, yeah, and if then it's I, there, it's I pleasant. Think, you know, you were you, you were asking about the uh, the third, third. Yeah. the third. Yeah, you were listening. I like that. <laughs> uh, um, Hollertau Blanc. Okay, Whoa. Hollertau Blanc. Yeah. So that's Crazy. sort of the uh, uh, the confuser, the the ace in the hole. Uh, I like Hollertau Blanc for its ability to provide a, a vinous character, a hmm. little white wine. Wow. 
a little florality. It, it's the intrigue hop where you, you get into the beer, and hopefully, if we're doing our job or if we're bringing something new to the table, you uh, you taste it and you're, you're confused. Yeah, not confused in a bad way, but confused in in, in that. The flavor we're not used to. Yeah, exactly. And, and in a positive way because it all gets back to how do you go about improving or, or moving forward the discussion on IPAs when they've been around so long sure. with so much fervor behind them to, to try to innovate. Yeah. You know, other than adding. Like any chef, you just bring the ingredients, the spices out into the table and yeah. make something unique yeah, with the with, spices. Without being gimmicky. The backbone's the same. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not one for, uh, you know. You know, throwing a couple of uh, artificial flavors or fruit or whatever at an IPA. Uh, if we can innovate in an area like this where we're using some hops that are sub-100 acres in the world or, yeah. you know, or throwing some combos together that haven't been tried, something non-obvious, then, you know, hey, it's a win. So we're not going to see the 37th Blood Orange IPA come out next week from uh, <laughs> Seismic Brewing Company? Very unlikely. <laughs> If I have anything to say, yeah. <laughs> which Two are good beers, now. of course, too. But I, I, your point is taken about some of the the gimmicks and doing the same thing. Yeah. Are all three of those hops added to the whirlpool, or some are just dry hopped? Uh, yeah. So the um, the whirlpool hops are um, primarily the O seven and, and the Belma. Okay. Um, we really tend to favor the the dry hop. There's so much uh, more experience, hop experience to be had if you if you're gentle on them by using them cold side. Some people are doing that technique where they whirlpool, but they lower the temperature yeah. of the wort first. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a all these. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so, you're not doing that. Uh, not on this particular beer. No. Okay. Um, in in this case, we're trying to preserve as much of the character as possible by favoring the dry hop. Okay. Uh, and it's also possible, you know, if you've been looking at some of the. Um, uh, peer-reviewed articles lately about bitterness through uh, through the ASBC. There's there's very good evidence to show that there's a, a favorable amount of uh, of bitterness to be gained from dry and hopping, dry hop. and you have to take that into account. So mm-hmm. when you know when somebody says I have this X number of IBUs, uh, there's some data to suggest that maybe you should be taking uh, an, an amount a of lab, a dry hop. Yeah, have it checked in lab. Yeah. How many IBUs do you think you're gaining in this beer in the dry hop? Oh, that is a good question. Okay. We've actually reached out to labs to ask them to perform this suggested new testing method. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you reach out to the old favorites, uh, you know, the White Labs, BDAS. Uh, a lot of these places aren't equipped to do it. Okay. <laughs> so you might have to be attached to a university level is research that lab. Because, <laughs> is that because part of it is this perceived bitterness? It's not the same measurement that we use, you know, in the in the kettle of bitterness? Yeah, yeah. Uh, partly because it's new and because most of these labs are equipped to perform ASBC approved testing methods. Okay, and anything outside of that um, is relatively new. Okay, uh, but based on what you were describing, that you have to take into account for this bitterness, you must have made an estimate of what it might be, and then I'm assuming reduced your kettle bitterness accordingly. Yes. So, what did you estimate there? Uh, yes. So, um, it's it's presumed that the amount of hulipones in your dry hops are going to be two thirds as bitter as regular <coughs> alpha. I mean, all all, all this mumbo jumbo aside, two I, two thirds is on the hot it, side. No, it oh, sounds like two thirds on the. Uh, so it's but only two thirds of what? what it would be on the hot side. Uh, so the the two thirds is comparing uh, apples to apples. If you were to take a uh, um, you know a, a solution of hulipon versus alpha acid oh. in the same concentration and you were to taste them both one would taste two-thirds as bitter as the other hmm. and so any ibu that you get from traditional bittering value so you which is alpha acid hot side yes okay. alpha, alpha acid um any any dry hop material that you get into the beer um is going to show up on a test as though it has a full ibu value but really perceived bitterness is going to be Two thirds as much. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, the long and the short is that the, the whole concept that we have, this paradigm of IBU, is maybe not as straightforward as a lot of beer drinkers might, <laughs> sure. you know, think right. it is. Um, 
you know, you, you see these labels that say 105 IBU or whatever. Well, really, what what is it? You know, it really comes well, how, down to how would you measure that? <laughs> yeah. well, it's, be not by yeah. lab. Probably. It's also somewhat. I guess I'm going to use the word annoying because it's annoying for me. Uh, it, it, it's it's always been that way where you know people were claiming 100 and something IBUs and then we kind of know you can only perceive so much. So it was always already difficult. And now that brewers have shifted to whirlpool and dry hopping mm-hmm. at such a large scale, now it's even more confusing to figure out what that number value means to mm-hmm. a consumer like me. Yeah, sure. right. Because half the time we're just it also it almost means shit. It's what I'm perceiving and what you know. I still think the balance that a brewer. Uh, takes into account and gives me in their beer means everything, right? But then in terms of how many IBUs there are, I could never tell you. Maybe I could never just, taste a beer and say, well, that one's 105. Maybe we should just stop making IPAs and just quit <laughs> with, with this IBU mess that we've started. As much as I want to agree with you, you're making no friends down there. <laughs> right. That's fine. I don't have any to lose. This is a man who was just featured on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle saying he thinks IPAs are shit. <laughs> Being, as he's being covered for the brewery he works for. So I think Beardy doesn't mind about making no, enemies at this point. Yeah, yeah, he's under the bus already. <laughs> yeah. 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 All of San Francisco. <laughs> he's lost two legs. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, wow, Beardy, you didn't hold back on that one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> okay, so th- that's sort of the equation you're using to take into account for, for dry hopping your beers and, and what your final bitterness might be. Yeah, as much as I'm a numbers and equation guy, it, it, it does come down to sensory. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if it doesn't pass the arm's length test where you, you, you can stand back from it, you stand back from all the math, all the planning, and just evaluate the beer. If it's not fantastic, then it fails. Okay. Yeah. I like this. An easy test. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. And then any any special dry hopping techniques that you guys employ or... Yeah. Oh, that is... Uh, is that a loaded one? We can take a break and come back. If, if you've got several answers, I'd love to talk about it. That That is a loaded one. All right. Um, so, yeah. If you're down to talk about it, sure. I'd like to make it a, a full conversation. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's do this, Deb. We're going to take a quick break, and we come back. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk uh, dry hopping techniques. We've got Seismic Brewing Company on the program with us. We've got some more beer to try, too. And we're going to talk about sustainability. So hang in there. It's the session. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Brewcasters. The Brewcasters on the Brewing Network. Your support of the Brewing Network means everything to us. We couldn't produce shows without you. And we love giving you something extra for that support. Like Brew Your Own Magazine. You already know it's a great brewing magazine full of recipes, equipment how-tos, discussions of beer styles, and brewing techniques. Whether you're new to brewing and just starting out or you're an old pro, you'll always learn something from the articles in Brew Your Own. Plus, there are amazing special issues like plans for building a Brutus 10 system, 250 classic clone recipes, and the Home Brewer's Answer Book. Brew Your Own Magazine and BYO.com are awesome resources for any brewer whether for yourself or as a gift when you subscribe or resubscribe from the brewing network homepage, you directly support programs like this get a great magazine and support the brewing network subscribe to brew your own right from the brewing network.com do you know the three most important rules in brewing sanitation sanitation and sanitation and no one does it better than five star chemicals five star knows sanitation you can only sanitize clean equipment and five star knows how to clean too for craft brewers and home brewers five star has what you need to keep your fermenters serving tanks kegs and draft lines sparkling and free of any beer spoiling bacteria pbw caustic acid cleaners star sand santa clean lubricants and defoamers ph stabilizer and more. Five Star Chemicals has cleaning supplies, safety supplies, heat exchangers, pumps, hoses, and valves. And Five Star is proud to offer eco-friendly products that exceed customer expectations. If you have a cleaning problem, you need the Five Star Solution. Visit FiveStarChemicals.com or call 800-782-7019. 800-782-7019. And get the Five Star Treatment today. 
Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20 gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your Brew Easy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman kettle cart. The Brew Easy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your Brew Easy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new Brew Easy all grain brewing system. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and brew with Blickman quality on your new Brew Easy. Hey guys, what'll it be? I'm not sure. What do you recommend? A lot of people seem to like the Hefeweizen. Is that a German Hefeweizen or more of an American style wheat beer? I'm not sure, but I can give you a taste. Okay, great. Great. The Cicerone Certification Program certifies and educates beer professionals in order to elevate the beer experience for consumers. Unfortunately, not every bar is staffed with certified beer servers who can guide their customers through a beer list. Here you go, guys. Let me know what you think of the Hefeweizen. Oh, yeah. That's definitely more of an American meat. But I can hardly tell because this beer just smells like sour butter. I wonder how long it's been since they cleaned the draft line. Yeah, and look at the bubbles on the side of the glass. It's filthy. Somebody should tell these guys about the Cicerone program. For sure. How about we head somewhere else for another beer? Your server should give beer the same respect you do. Request quality. The Cicerone certification program offers four levels of beer certification, in-person classes, and course books for beer professionals. Check them out at Cicerone.org. The Cicerone Certification Program. We know beer. Hi, this is Tyler from Libertine Brewing Company in the central coast of California. You're listening to Brewing Network, The Session. It sucks. Does it suck? It sucks. But that's what's good about it is that it sucks, right? All right, welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. We've got Seismic Brewing Company in the studio with us. And before we move on, we're going to talk about some dry hopping techniques. I want to remind you about uh, our good friends over at White Labs. Have you visited the vault for homebrewers? It's White Labs' collection of specialty, one-of-a-kind strains where you're able to pre-order and decide which strains are released to homebrewers. White Labs has added 20 new specialty strains in the vault right now with other strains to be added throughout the year. So all all you have to do is visit whitelabs.com slash the vault and place a pre-order on the strain you'd like to use. Once it reaches 150 orders, White Labs will release the yeast and ship it directly to your doorstep. And there's good news for professional brewers, too. If you want to access any of the vault strains for your next brew day, just place a minimum order of one and a half liters through yeastman.com or by contacting a customer service rep and you'll get access to their unique specialty strains, too. Whitelabs.com slash the vault. Go check it out. All right. We're still talking to Andy Hooper. He's the brewmaster over at Seismic Brewing Company. And uh, we've got another one of his beers in our glass right now, too. But before we get to that, uh, we were just about to start talking about dry hopping techniques. And uh, Andy was going to give us a little bit of insight into how they do it at Seismic. Yeah, as promised. Um, Dry hopping uh, largely falls into two sort of camps, I guess. Um, And one is dry hop early and the other is dry hop late. Okay. So the strategies here. Uh, dry hop early has origins supposedly with Firestone Walker. Now you can bring Matt on here. I'm not going to speak for him, but yeah. when I, you know, I was a, a home brewer and a young gun, I was researching these things. Some of which were, uh, you know, posited by Matt at CBC and things like that. Sure. And his argument was, uh, I hope I'm not misquoting him, but his argument was there is a delicate balance, and you need to have yeast action on the hops because yeast actually will act on and ferment oh. yeah. parts of the hops and they'll, they'll, they'll release extra um, limonene which will enhance the citrus character of the beer mm. and so that's the argument for early the other argument for late is 
too much mechanical action of the hops. If you add them too early, the yeast will create so much uh, action that they'll scrub aromas. Okay. All right. So how do we go about uh, having our cake and eating it too? My theory is we split the dry hop into two parts. And so we'll dry hop right about 80% of fermentation. Mm -hmm towards the end so there's still a little bit of you know there's there's yeast in suspension and they're still active and happy and everything else and you dry hop at that point and then a couple of days later when yeast activity is very low you will need to dry hop again and it will need the assistance of some sort of action because you know the hop pellets depending on the provider are anywhere oh. from very loose to you know so Tight. dense that Rocks. yeah yeah they, they didn't break one yeah it's it's terrible right. um and that's another discussion that you can have with your hop provider oh, yeah yeah don't send those anymore yeah all that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah you say you know I'd, I'd rather they weren't you know hard enough to put into my wood stove exactly. um, right <laughs> so although that would smell good <laughs> you got me there. Yeah, absolutely would. Um, and so, anyway, so you, you, you split it up into, into two, or at least we do. But the uh, second time, you need to uh, rouse the... We actually rouse uh, both, just to be both. sure. Yeah. I see. So you're doing a, a by, by on the side side vessel to, like, make a slurry and then push it into the fermenter? Uh, it actually goes all into the main fermenter. Um, in the top? Or yeah, again, so this, this gets back to oh. uh, how um, seismic differentiated a little bit. Oh, cool. I had the... Uh, ability to start from scratch i wasn't working with fermenters that pre-existed and trying to figure out how to dry hop them mm-hmm. i had the ability to say hey i would like I all of my fermenters to have candy cane blow off arms because that yeah. will help when we put our can cannon online and oh, we you use the, the shut the gun yeah. yeah yeah we have a hauntman can cannon <clears throat> and so we can blow up to uh, it's, uh, 150 pounds of hops pretty awesome wow all up into in the one shot at a given time. 150 yeah. one shot in nice. one shot yeah i had to upsize the co2 delivery line and the vaporizer just to be able to do it yeah <laughs> wow uh the flow what's what's that the candy cane line huh what's the diameter of that it's two inch Two inch, yeah, That's it's big. two inch. Nice. All of the CO two delivery piping in the plant is is two inch. Ooh. It was designed to do uh, two thousand pounds of CO two vaporized per hour, which is a metric buttload for oh. the technical in the, <laughs> uh, in yeah. the, uh-huh. in the uh-huh. audience. Uh, they can deliver. There's push behind that, that two inch line to make all that happen. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Just to be able to to you know a- aggressively send those hops up through the candy mm-hmm. cane and, and deposit them evenly across the top of the of the beer. Okay, which you don't always have an opportunity to do. Uh, you know, before we we came in on the, sh- on the show, I was talking to some folks out there about old school dry hopping techniques. You know, getting on the old ladder or the scissor lift. Or oh whatever. yeah, and there are some awesome war stories from <laughs> from some more tenured brewers about. Getting up on the ladder and then having nucleation, nucleation. foams in your face and you fall oh, over. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, all those ocean nightmares that they love to hear about. Sure. Um, you know, and I've done them. And it's, it's part of earning your stripes, I guess. But in this case, I had an opportunity to design a way that was faster yeah. and simpler and yeah. didn't uh, include all that foaming. You don't have to do a high wire act either. You just do it off the ground. <laughs> well, That's right. And, and so just so I understand, uh, like what I'm hearing is how you get it from the floor up to the top and uh, and onto the top. But yeah. what is the mechanical process that allows the, you know, the, the pellets to break up and, and then be how you want them so that they go into solution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you first step is you know the, the dry hop cannon, which allows you to, to deposit them on the top of actively fermenting beer. Beer, then they hydrate and these pellets uh, begin to break apart. Okay, and they will sink. There are some pellets that arrive to you, whether you like it or not. There's no getting around it. Some of them will sink. Yeah, there's floating hops uh, and there's sinking <laughs> hops, and the ones that sink will go all the way down to the bottom into the yeast cake, and they'll still break apart a little bit into a slurry, but then they're sitting on top of your yeast, and that's not doing anybody any good. Okay, so you provide some some mechanical action. Uh, in the case of Sierra Nevada, they do this whole torpedo thing. They don't use pellets, of course, but they actively pump the beer over itself, and that's providing the the, the mixing, the homogenization that yeah. you know gets all of that hop essence mixed into the beer. So what we do with our pellets, we we send them into the hop can, and we blow them in on top, and then inevitably some of them settle. Mm-hmm. And so we have already removed yeast, and then we provide a big roust with CO2, in case any uh, hop clumps have stuck to the bottom of that fermenter, we blow them back up and we okay. give them an opportunity to extract. Very, very simple, but very effective. And presumably, 
you've only already removed the yeast for the second, like later dry hopping, or actually for the first, even for the first. Okay, for the first, yeah. And and this is this is yeast uh, uh, yeast variety dependent. Okay, uh, some people will have a, a yeast that will immediately flocculate. It's, sure. it's it's done fermenting on you know three days, thirty six, you know forty eight hours or something crazy. Just yeah. like it's done, and and that doesn't that's not the case with our particular strain of yeast. Um, but you you need to plan for that. If yeast is not going to play a role in that mechanical mixing action, yeah. you need to simulate it by doing rousting or pump over or something like that. Uh, otherwise, you know it, you, you run the risk of putting these really delicious, aromatic, wonderful hops into the top of your tank, yeah. and then you rack them out before you go to transfer, filtration, centrifugation, whatever you're going to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, when you blow the hops up and over, you know, you know on the candy cane, mm-hmm. when it makes the arc, is there like a china hat or something underneath that that'll spread them out across the top, or oh. you pretty much shoot into like a Asian one American foot area, hat, please. Oh, Asian American hat. Sorry, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a cone, oh, kind of a flat and cone. Yeah. Internal calandria. Yeah, something, please. Whatever. Oh, that's only in the that's catalog. How do you spread them out? Baby name. They uh, they actually blow into uh, the top of the fermenter at, at a location that's as central to the top of the tank as possible. Okay. So sure. the candy cane doesn't go you know immediately against the sidewall. It goes out near where the spray ball is right. to the middle of the tank, mm-hmm. and it does it with such violence. It's oh, it pretty much spraying them. I mean, it, I yeah. It's, it's so like it's, a, a, it's a Central American hat. It's exploding. What it is. <laughs> it's like uh, 2,000 pounds coming out of a two-inch pipe. and uh, you, have yeah. to vent the, you have to vent the whole thing, too. Right? Yeah. Right, you do have to vent it, yeah. It's like Doc on his yeah. wedding night. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're getting into analogy. If, if, if it's powerful and aggressive and inaccurate, then we're talking about the Kalashnikov of yeah, pop <laughs> techniques. Sounds yeah. like Doc on his wedding night. It'll we're, shoot in any environment. We're just offending everybody right now. Yeah. Like, let's get we're gonna, if we're going to do it, we're going across yeah. the map. Well, it sounds kind of a little bit complicated. Are you, are you okay with re- repeatability? Can you do this like on a consistent basis? Yeah. Can you okay, fine? Yeah, I, I definitely feel so. Cool. Um, the, the, the company Hotman, who we bought our little hop cannon from, oh. they actually sell this entire pipe fence monstrosity that will allow you to centralize it and hard pipe the whole thing. <laughs> like injectors, but into the ferment. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Wow. Pretty cool. Wow. Um, you know, Sounds like a future upgrade for you. Little beer geek sexy. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe at some point. <laughs> if you didn't know in the beginning, yeah. For right. the moment, the, the practical side of me is perfectly happy rolling a, a, a little vessel up to one of our mini fermenters and blowing yeah. them on the top. That is working just fine. But well, yeah, because yeah, I imagine the, the things that we're thinking about, right, Tasty, like like not enough going in the center, maybe a few pellets that don't dissolve enough, it's it's minimal compared to the, the full amount of hops that you're adding into there, right? So you, it's just working just fine, I guess, is what I'm saying. The, the tiny bits you, you, you don't need to worry about. Yeah, the homogeneity on, the, on, on these large-scale brews is pretty good yeah um especially we, if you're researching anyway we're gonna even once it makes its initial drop the the rousing, those pellets yeah, rousing. take a day or 10 minutes yeah uh you're still gonna research the thing anyway yeah absolutely okay you know we're, we're talking about hops that are getting blown up 20 feet in the air and then they have the opportunity to settle on you know effectively a 18 or 20 foot column of beer and work their way yeah. all the way down and so you know scalability is important here. If you're if you're brewing a ten gallon batch, those same pellets only have the opportunity sure to, to, to fall through what eighteen inches of a, mm-hmm. of a little pilot fermenter. Right. Uh, so we have some economies of scale. You get way better uh, contact time, aroma extract, everything because we're playing on the on the larger scale. And we, we actually sure. unfortunately have to take that into account when we brew on our little pilot system, which, which is ten gallon. You'll get a different extraction. Yeah. 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 For me, this wouldn't be very efficient, but it would be a lot more fun as if you used open fermenters and shot them t- the hops exactly. 20 feet in the air and then just let them drop into the, the fermenter. That would be a lot more, be a much more fun mm-hmm. brewing day. I mean, if we're going there, you should just put the hops up in the air and shoot beer at it. Yeah. Just shoot beer at it. <laughs> That's even better, actually. It's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Well, that's so, a good carnival game. Yeah, Crosley's new brewery. No beer ever leaves right. the – it's no. just a fun house. Oh, I ruined it. No, <laughs> Oxidation <laughs> Brewing Company. You're always yeah. cleaning the ceiling. Yeah. That's all we do. Yeah. Clean and throw hops in the air. All right, let's try this next beer that's in our glass, uh, which I believe is the Deep Tectonic Nitro Imperial Stout. Do I have that right? Mm. Yeah, you do. You do. Um, that's a lot of mouthful. Yeah. All right, there's there's too many innuendos going on. With, 
<laughs> with our names already. I, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. You know, I I will take no credit for that. Uh, <laughs> that was crowdsourced from our wonderful brewing packaging. And executive management crew, I think. Actually, the majority of these names actually come from higher up than you might think. Okay. Um, anyway, Deep Tectonic uh, is a wonderful name for a, a beer that is a, effectively an imperial Irish export stout. Okay. Now, that in, is of, in of itself is a, is a mouthful. Yes. Did you invent that? Imperial export. I've never seen those in the same sentence. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, an Irish, thro- Irish in there, too. Yeah, I mean, don't try to put us in a box. <laughs> yeah. Let's take it as it is. Yeah. Let's drink the goddamn yeah. beer. Yeah, I mean, we, we make it up as we go along. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, Russian Imperial stouts out there, you know, all these things. They're all fantastic. Actually, it was our uh, a VP of sales and marketing that, that showed an interest in doing a an Irish stout. Uh, his name is Tom, Tom McGinty. Good. And, uh, hmm, good. Uh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I know he's biased now. Yeah. He, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, he also, you know, works his butt off. So, mm. you know, he he he's earned a little <clears throat> bit of input on a beer. Sure. You know, he showed an interest in doing a an Irish export stout. Fine. He wanted to do an imperial version of one. Fine. We worked around. We did three or four uh, small scale trials of the thing. Uh, some of them more successful than others and then we decided to go for this one and this is featuring dark malts from all over the place there's a little bit of uh actually patagonia's 190 caramel in there it's like the dark darkest caramel i've ever heard of okay 190 is crazy yeah, yeah. so yeah. It, it brings uh as much of those toffee notes as you can get without bordering on like black patent where it's all just ashtray and, and astringent mm-hmm. um there's also some chocolate rye in there so chocolatey flavor is a little, little earthy as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to go fairly big because in the background, I was really gaming hard for trying to put a little bit of this beer into barrels. Okay. Which, I mean, you know, cats out of the bag. We did. Uh, we, we did. <laughs> we, we, we put half this bat, batch into uh, Buffalo Trace barrels. Awesome. And so it's, it's pretty dry. It's hiding away. Yeah, yeah. actually. It yeah. Is I mean, is it, might, would it be too dry for barrels? I mean, barrels need like, like a more... Uh, more of that. Uh, that is a character. good, good question. Yeah. Um, the barrels, arguably, uh, and I'm a huge bourbon fan myself. The uh, the, the barrels are going to add not to actual sweetness, but perceived, perceived sweetness. Because I mean, what is American bourbon without right. vanilla, toffee, mm-hmm. caramel, coconut, all those kind of flavors? So Scotch. I mean. We'll Anytime see. you have a flavor that looks for sweetness, you'll find sweetness. Your, your yeah. brain will do that. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so my thinking on this one is, you know, we bring a nice, robust, uh, but not over the top sweet stout, and we we age it into barrels. We lay it away for a year. Hmm. Uh, hopefully, it'll be out in about October, November next year. Um, that the the perceived fullness from this barrel, uh, or these actually twelve barrels that we've got, are are going to you know add that. That missing fullness nice. without the heat. Uh, that's that's a big part of it. Uh, it, it. It plays into how you partner up with the barrel that you select. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go to certain distilleries, some of them will age out their spirits at 125 proof, which is the legal max for bourbon. Others will age out lower, and they also choose to incorporate more rye. Uh, or, or more wheat, less rye, or whatever. Right. Anyway, so there, there's a lot of strategy in it, and I happen to be a big fan of some of the some of the whiskeys that come out of uh, Buffalo Trace, specifically for the fact that they age at a lower proof with more wheat and all that kind of stuff. And I thought that maybe those tactics on their behalf would pair well with a Rush, uh, not Russian, but a uh, an Irish Irish stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, sounds like a good strategy to me. Yeah. 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 Anyway, it, it could all be a bunch of. You know, hey. just hooey. You're gonna oh, find out. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. You start with the concept, and then you you know you adjust on the way. Yeah, sure. Yeah. How long do you think you are going to age it in these barrels? Um, so with non-soured beers, uh, my philosophy, and maybe it's, may not be popular, is to uh, is to predetermine about how long you're going to age them. Okay, and just let them go. Don't uh, don't try to intervene with fate. You know, sample them a bunch of times and. And all this other kind of stuff. I know a lot of folks do that, and and that's very valid for sour beers. You got to keep up on what's going on with them. But for barrel aged beers, uh, a sample uh, too soon can be misleading. Okay. You you, uh, you know you do the 
the oh. Russian River Vinny, you know, drill, nail trick. Do the whole nail trick thing, and that is genius, by the way. I gotta mm-hmm. give him credit for that. Um, or whoever he stole. He got it from uh, yeah. from Cantillon. Yeah. <laughs> Cantillon. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, whatever. Anyway, that's uh, that's a real smart tactic, and uh, you know, at times I found myself in a position where going to try to observe the barrel or monitor it has maybe caused more risk or harm than just letting it do its thing. It sounds like you're talking about not harm to the beer itself, but maybe to your decision-making, that you might make a judgment call too soon and and alter the course of the beer that way, not that you'd be contaminating it or something by taking a sample. That's what I got out of it, too. Yeah, well, I guess actually both are valid. Anytime you, you go and you open a barrel, which is... You know, if you do it right, it's a hermetically sealed vessel. Yeah. Anytime you go to open it, whether it be a, you know removing the bung and taking a, a thief sample or removing a nail or whatever, you do you know, however small you you risk, you know, contaminating it. And especially these really sweet high end gravity beers, there's plenty of delicious nutrients for a you know a bacteria or a wild yeast diastatic or whatever to to take hold. Um, so I guess it's sort of like the uh, the, the Heisenberg un- uncertainty principle of, yeah. of beer. You know, it, as soon as you observe it, it changes. Okay, that kind of thing. I don't know. Maybe it's superstition, but um, I uh, I know lots of breweries have done research on this whole. You know, the oh. the, the pickup of you mm-hmm. know barrel lactones and vanillins and all this kind of stuff. And so there's some data there, but I, I prefer just to to pre predetermine uh, you know an amount of time that you're willing to let the beer sit okay and then you know, if all go well goes well remove it got it so 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 you I like your process uh, so you'll, you'll then taste these beers would you then be willing to like change your method depending on what you taste at the end of the period that you've defined sure um, well it, it's kind of a go no go it's more about like I'll just get those same barrels and I expect to get the same result That's what you're doing as much as you can, and I, I, that level of consistency in barrel sourcing is part of what's missing from probably uh, a lot of the uh, sour, or yeah. at least sour beers, but probably uh, bourbon beers too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of people's barrel programs. Uh, it's hard to develop relationships. There's whatever eight thousand craft oh, yeah. breweries, and there's you know a handful <laughs> of distilleries. Sometimes yeah. you're just asking around who's got barrels. Yeah. yeah, and it's tough. And I've definitely gone through various avenues. There's you know good old Tom Griffin who's still oh, yeah. sure. you know also name. Uh, yeah, you know, and that, it's crazy. There, there's no, there's no website. There's no formal oh, name. Truck. Whatever. There's a cell phone the number. Truck. Right on the road. <laughs> yeah, the ground right the road with the that's, truck. That's wild. You call up this number, and there's this voice on the other end. Who you, you know, yeah, I'll have some barrels for you at this warehouse in Treasure Island. Come pick them up. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> that can't be the way that this works. Um, he's from like Tennessee, or he's like from another part of the country yeah. too. I think he's like, this. yeah, yeah, it's wild. <laughs> well, I like the beer already. So I'm looking forward to trying the next iteration. Now here, of course, you have it on Nitro at the Hop Grenade. If you want to come by and try it, it'll probably be on for another few days anyway. Sure. Um, and is that the only format that you have made the beer is on Nitro? Uh, no, actually, this first batch, the non-barrel-age version, was offered as a standard CO2 draft okay. and, and also Nitro. Nice. And uh, we were a, a little over, overzealous in the brewery. There's a lot of uh, uh, guys among our production team who... Uh, are in love with nitro beers. Mm, um, I didn't know how how much nitro would play a role in our draft offering or, or whatever, so I only had one of our bright tanks uh, upgraded to nitro capability, which requires well, if you're doing it right, it, it requires an ASME uh, tank which can handle oh, higher, higher pressure. pressure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I had I had our smallest bright tank, the one and only sixty barrel bright. Uh, you know, equipped with the ability to do nitro just in case we wanted to do it. And lo and behold, one of the first limited releases that we do, we took advantage of that ability immediately. Nice. And did a nitro beer. And we nitroed the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean? Like, I mean, with CO2, it's, I'm not going to say you're, it's always the same, but there's some relatively standard. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it different for nitro? Mm-hmm. So there's uh, CO2 volumes and then there's a nitrogen index. Okay. Oh, there, there's there's different, in, uh, you know, instruments that you can use to measure those. Uh, the the instrument that we have that actually measures both uh, is an Anton Parr instrument, and it it'll tell you CO2 volumes and then an estimate of nitrogen index. And you know, being the uh, young, precocious, overzealous people that we are, we were like, well, you know, if a little bit is good, more is better. 
and yeah. we injected multiple tanks of nitrogen into this very small vessel just <laughs> wow. just for funsies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it's proven to be uh, just on the side of challenging for s- some bartenders who are used to their standard Guinness tap. I see. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's hard to beat that beautiful cascade. Sure. Uh, you know, so maybe well, we'll, we'll dial it back a little bit in the future. Although if you do, like, the traditional Guinness pour, where you sort of half and half, Stop, it, yeah. it might work. Like, if you just do the whole pour, yeah. maybe... Yeah. Three quarters, I think, is what it I is. I see. Yeah. Okay. You know, instant gratification is an American hallmark. <laughs> and so... Yeah. That's right. Even if you tell the most avid of craft brewers, like, hey, come on, you know, you, you have Slow to wait down. two minutes or five minutes, God <laughs> forbid. Yeah. You know, how much twittering or whatever can you do in that time they're not going to want to sit around and wait for their pint to settle out and make that nice creamy head on top so you know yeah. I, and i'll admit i was that I, I got to go to ireland on my trip for a couple of days Whoa. um and every pub i went to i was like can i have my fucking beer already and it didn't matter if it was a murphy's it didn't matter if it was a guinness they all poured it properly yep. and it's a it's a five minute pour yeah, it's yeah. it's easily a five minute pour, mm-hmm. and, and and I wasn't used to it. I don't really drink stouts that often at, at home or anything. So the first time it happened, I was like, "What the fuck is going on?" There's nobody in this pub, <laughs> and but I look Where's over and there's the beer sitting uh, as he's doing ten other things. Comes back at the perfect time and pours it. There's it, it, and you know what? Every time that beer was perfect in my glass. Good, just the right amount of head on it. Uh, every every little bit. <laughs> Um, also, just while we're on the, the topic, I got to spend uh, a couple of days at Jameson while I was out there oh, awesome. doing a, a private tour. I was, I was telling Beardy about it, JP. <laughs> I'm totally the, – the, the whole thing lost on me. It should have been you guys. Right. Uh, I got invited <laughs> uh, by, uh, by a friend. But for the first time, I, I enjoyed uh, drinking whiskey, tasting with them. Nice. And we learned a lot about the barrels. I got to go – they have like – Something like a million barrels are. It's a. Well, um, you, you drive through the complex and it's a, a, a farm of warehouses. Basically, you where, drive where they're where they're, you have to drive everywhere on the on the compound. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that uh, was particularly interesting to me, they, they also took me into where they uh, they don't make barrels there because they mostly use bourbon barrels from America. Yeah. Um, but, but, but they repair them. Um, and anyhow, they they had an open barrel, and he told me to you know stick my head in there, <laughs> and uh, and give it a give it a smell. Yeah. <clears throat> and and he, you know, he's like, do you do you think that uh, you think that smells like whiskey? And I said, oh, absolutely. And he said, well, whiskey has never touched that barrel. That's barrel. That's barrel. that's oak uh-huh. and vanilla. That's like. It's <laughs> vanilla oak. It's all the things that you that you mentioned that, uh, that a beer should impart. Yeah. And he said that's why whiskey takes tastes like this barrel. The yeah. barrel does not taste like whiskey. Right. It's, the, it's the exact. <laughs> I know it's sort of obvious, but he said, sure. it's the exact reason yeah. that we're putting it in into these things. Yeah. But it was. I was very quick to have it backwards like sure that tastes like whiskey no it does not it actually smells like barrel right um which i just found fascinating and then um you know we talked a lot about the the cask proofs too or i think there's were, were something like 120 yeah um, 123 which of course we tasted Ish. right out of the barrel um which was interesting uh, <laughs> it, it was <laughs> interesting i'll bet it was you just need a sip yeah, I definitely learned. I was essentially wetting my lips, type of sipping yeah. at that at, <laughs> at that point. But yeah. again, still fascinating the the transformation because we would go from from there to the uh, then they took us to the lab and gave us the actual product um, after it had been diluted and things like that. But yeah. um, it's now much more interesting for me to listen to uh, brewers talk about the barrels and especially those like you who are fans of of bourbon and and whiskey, knowing how to impart those flavors into beer rather than just imparting heat, which to me is like the beer is almost like tasting a, a cask strength um, whiskey yeah, uh, with with too much heat. and um, So it was a lot of fun and, and just cool to get to learn about that, that process. Yeah, actually. That's it, cool. It is uh, an, a really interesting point that you, you bring up, you know, that the uh, it's the logical reversal. The whiskey tastes like the barrel, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. Um, there was some common knowledge, I guess we'll call it, um, at my first exposure of barrel aging where people said, you know, you, you can age a beer in this whiskey barrel. And when you're done, you can recondition, quote unquote, that barrel by throwing, you know, a, a couple of handles of whatever inexpensive brandy old crow into, or something, you and know. Just rolling around. Interesting. Yeah, okay. you roll it around. Well, yeah. all right. Let, let, let's approach this logically. 
that whiskey barrel, which is 53 gallons, kicked out uh, after dilution however many hundreds of bottles of whiskey that all contained yeah. really rich flavor. Whether you like it or not, whatever, you know, your brand favorite or everything, that, uh, that, that barrel kicked out probably 25-ish, let's say, to 30 cases of whiskey. Hmm. Mm. All right? Yeah. And the the logical fallacy here is that you can take one of those bottles out of those 25 <laughs> cases <laughs> and pour it back into the barrel yeah. and recondition that experience. That's not true. No. It just makes no sense. No, mm. it doesn't. Um, you might be able to use ethanol to sort of maybe do a, a little resanitization. Oh, yeah, yeah, it might have that effect. Um, eh, that's arguable. But okay, yeah. you've scrubbed the barrel already. You've. All, well, all, the, gonna... all the barrel flavor went into your whiskey. Yeah. It had to come from somewhere. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, even that, though, uh, was an interesting thing to me because, of course, the, you, you talk about how often you might use a barrel and uh, and, and repeating it. And the, the barrel master at Jameson was, was very quick to point out the osmosis that takes place. So, in other words, it's not just yeah. a one. You know, the way yeah. you're describing, Doc, is, and I don't maybe don't mean it this way, but to me, it sounds like a one-way transition no. of flavor. But it's really not. It's mm. it's an osmosis that sort of it's, you just consider it recirculating through the wood. Well, mm-hmm. So, which is why there's so much of the flavor still left even after it's used for bourbon. Well, that's yeah. when you it's know. year after year, and it's yeah. uh, warm season, cold season, and it. In and out. In and out of this barrel. This osmosis in and out of the barrel. Yeah. Absolutely. The thing is that all those flavors have to go somewhere. It goes into your whiskey. If and you, some if, go back into the if wood. If you've tasted yeah. whiskey off the still, I've tasted Mac- Macallan right off the still. Mm. It's like gym socks. <laughs> it's boring. <laughs> right. Yeah. But once it comes out of the barrel, and they, they really take their barrels seriously. Yeah. And it's a whole different thing. Sure. Uh, what you were talking about, when they recondition the barrels. Yeah. With yeah. one bottle. Just well, no, 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 you're not going to do that. No, no. They're talking about s- stripping all the char off of it and oh. then recharring. Oh, I see. Stuff that. like that. Oh, man. A lot, of, a lot of work went into getting that uh, number three or number four alligator char in that barrel. Yeah. And you put a high-pressure washer on it yep. and strip all of that material. Yeah. They're trying, they're trying yeah. to get deeper into the oak and trying to get more out of it. But, yeah. You know, they're not buying bourbon barrels for nothing. Right, right. No, they're buying, they're buying bourbon barrels because since 1936, with a couple of lapses until 1945, right. there was an American law that said you couldn't use barrels twice. Bourbon for, barrels can't uh, be used twice as part of the law. Okay. Yeah. One, one of the bourbon laws, there's a couple of them, but Scotch people are cheap. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, well, so no, you we have this. And, and there's still huge good, pool. still good barrel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So why not? You're good enough for the Irish at Jameson, that's for sure. Well, like they come I said, from wild turkey, so I'll tell you that. And uh, anything, if you any, any of the Frog fans out there, those all come from Maker's Mark. So, okay. Uh, uh-huh. uh, that's cool. It's really interesting uh, little global, economical, mildly incestuous yeah. relationship that's going on here with uh, American bourbon and then overseas. Sure. You know, space side distilling. By the way, they mix need- in uh, port and sherry barrels as well. It's not all. It's not a hundred percent bourbon barrel, oh, really? and some of that changes, like the uh, percentage, based on um, which Jameson you might be buying. But it's I different blends. Uh, but I do think yeah. I, I don't think that any of them are one hundred percent bourbon barrel. I think they all mm-hmm. have some mixture of of a port barrel, uh, especially McCall- uh, McCallans. Is, they're really <coughs> weird with their barrels. Hmm. Uh, they mostly use Spanish barrels. Uh, they pay people. They pay the winemakers to use the barrels. Yeah. They they source their own oak. Yeah. Jameson they make does the barrels, some of the same. The, the winemakers do it, and they buy them back from them. It's it's a whole. Yeah. It's a glo- Like you say, it's this global, this global process thing. of yeah. of barrels. Yeah. Well, we could save the rest of this discussion for an episode of our new show, Heads and Tails. Oh yeah. Hell. Uh, hey. which, oh, will hell. Be, which will be launching uh, later yeah. this month uh, with JP and Beardy here. Um, if you have, do you have time for another segment? Because we didn't even get to sustainability, so we can either cram sure. it in short right now, or take a little break and actually spend a little time on it. You got time for that? Uh, up to you. You're good. Yeah, I down. wouldn't mind spending a little time. It's a, it's a short end segment that we do anyway, um, but it'll give us time to talk about some of the sustainability practices awesome. that you're doing. So, all right, here's what we're going to do. Then we're going to take a little break, and uh, when we come back, uh, more with Seismic Brewing, um, so that we can spend some time talking about sustainability because they're helping to pave the way for future brewers 
folks to do the same. So hang in there. It's the session. We'll be right back with more. To the Brewcasters. Brewcasters on the Brewing Network. Since 1979, Williams Brewing has offered the finest equipment and freshest ingredients and the best customer service in the business. Check out their brand new patent pending mash and boil 110 volt electric mashing and boiling unit. This compact all stainless unit lets you mash, sparge, and boil just about anywhere that has a 110 volt plug. Double wall construction adds to efficiency and safety, and a precise thermostat keeps temperatures where you want them. Unlike insulated buckets and converted coolers, multiple temperature Rest mashing is easy to do, all for under 300 bucks. They also feature the Mark II Work Pump, a magnetic drive high temperature pump that does the work of pumps that cost twice as much, as well as exclusive Brewer's Edge regulators and quality Keg King kegs and disconnects. Check them out today at WilliamsBrewing.com to bruise their vast selection. With over 20 years of experience making world class craft beer and more than 100 gold medals in international competitions, Moylan's Brewing Company is not just a pretty face in craft beer. Just ask Brendan Moylan. What do we got here? The beer of the hour. Moylan's, gotta love that big M. It's like a sign of awesomeness. It's got an extra kick to it. Let's pour this bad boy. Oh, Easy oh yeah. Oh, Moylan's. The end of the night when the kids are finally in bed, the wife's in bed, <laughs> nobody's bothering your ass anymore. That's Moylan's time. Moylan's is for you. Yeah. It's to help you out. Yeah. It helps me out. What? Well, because it's freaking awesome. Northern California brewed. It's brewed with love. With love? Oh, yeah. Tremendous. And it's always best where? Moylan's. You've got to try it on tap at Moylan's. In Novato. They're friggin' awesome. Not only because I own the brewery, because I love the beer. Cheers! Boom! Kilt Lifter Scotch Ale takes big beers to a whole new level with rich malt balanced perfectly with delicate hops and now comes in four pack tall boy cans so you can take the party on the go. Or come to the brewery, take a tour, and try any of Moylan's fresh creations right from the source. Check them out at Moylan's.com. Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters, this is Jamel Zanishef, and I want to tell you about Heretic Evil Twin. You might be familiar with my homebrew recipe, which uses massive late hopping to create a balance between the malty sweet and the hoppy bitter, along with an outrageous malt and hop character. I wanted a beer with the same bold hop and malt character, so we played around with the homebrew recipe until we were able to make a great commercial version, too. We've created a beer rich in malt character, full of caramel, toast, biscuit, and an ever-so-subtle roast note. On top of that, we piled in an insane amount of Citra and Columbus hops at the end of the boil, as well as in dry hopping. This damn-the-cost approach to hopping gives Heretic's Evil Twin a great blast of citrus and tropical fruit that can't be matched by any other hop. The result is a bold, malty, hoppy, but easy-drinking beer. This is our top seller, our flagship beer, and I couldn't be prouder of it. Cheers. To find Heretic Beers near you, click on Find Some at hereticbrewing.com. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for hanging out with us. I wanted to let you know about Neshaminy Creek Brewing. Uh, They've been on the Philly Beer Map since 2012, and just recently uh, took home their fourth Philly Beer Scene Magazine Award for Brewer of the Year. Um, That's 2014, 15, 16, and 17. Uh, Two JBF Vienna-style gold gold medals, um, and uh, also a bronze for their smoke lager. So uh, they've recently expanded and renovated their tap room with 24 beers on tap. Uh, 18 of which are rotating and seasonal limited beers. So go check them out. They do free brewery tours on Saturdays. You can go to NeshaminyCreekBrewing.com. And we love those guys. A lot of fun. Got to hang out with them uh, during GABF this week a little bit. And uh, it's a good time. This week? Uh, uh, this year. Sorry. Oh. This year. Yeah. G- <laughs> I, it's perpetually GABF for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, cool. That's right. We've still got Seismic Brewing Company. Andy Hooper is on the show with us today. Um, and I promised that we would talk a little 
little bit about sustainability. Um, and let me start this because you, you, I'd like you to correct me if I'm wrong. But the the rumor I heard uh, is that it's not just that you guys are doing sustainable brewing practices, which we've covered on the show uh, quite a bit. But I've heard that you guys are trying to do it in such a way and on such a scale that other smaller breweries can follow in your footsteps and afford to do it themselves rather than say the scale that, that Sierra Nevada does it on with, with these very large and expensive uh, systems. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, you nailed it. Okay. Um, so in the uh, 60s and 70s there were companies, uh, among them a company called Biothane. They used to work for larger you know, corporate production facilities. We're talking about the uh, A.B. Miller Coors, whatever of the industry. And they were able to provide wastewater solutions to these facilities that would not only treat the wastewater until it was basically harmless or ineffective on the environment, but also it would reclaim some sort of energy for them. Mm. Okay. So we're talking about technology that's been around for quite a long time. Yeah. But it's been inaccessible to, you know, Joe Twelve Pack, who's trying to open his own little brewery or whatever else. And I love so, that guy. Yeah, right? Yeah, good friend of mine. Anyway, uh, so, you know, scaling these technologies down, not only the wastewater treatment technology, but overall uh, electrical efficiency or natural gas efficiency, these technologies have been, you know, increased to the point where smaller guys are able to reach out and touch them. Excellent. And, you know, that's really cool, really cool. Um, It's part of an electronics age uh, where you didn't have to fire up this boiler that weighs 100,000 pounds and you have to heat that whole surface up, whatever. There's boilers now that are very efficient, mm-hmm. and that efficiency comes from these electronic controls okay. that are able to fire the boiler up, and they actually monitor steam use. A little, you know, a little instrumentation, but they'll they'll look at what's going on in in the, the steam pipeline, and when the brew house needs steam, they ramp up, and when only a couple of users in packaging are using them, they ramp down, and they only utilize the amount of utilities that are really required to do the job. And okay. this is not like rocket science stuff, but it is cool that this technology has been advanced to the point where little guys are easily able to pick up the phone and say, you know, I want energy efficient electric motors for my cart pumps or cellar pumps or whatever else. Yeah, so there's a small premium that you have to pay. Okay. You just have to know what to ask for. And you go, you know, I want I want the premium electrical efficiency on my pumps. Or I want the uh, you know, I want some sort of a modulating system on my boiler steam. Mm-hmm. It, it, these are these are concepts that you know I'm trying to illustrate have been around for a little while mm-hmm. and they used to only be accessible to the Big boys. Yeah. And now they are through the you know the miracle of probably overseas manufacturing. Whatever. Yeah. Anyway, th- you know the the availability of this technology is is now a little bit more widespread. And you know if you are even five or ten thousand barrels a year, you do have access to this. Okay. That's really cool. And yes. so in the process of you guys implementing some of these technologies, are are you sort of documenting and, and making available to other breweries your experience? Because I think it's still um, maybe trial and error isn't the isn't the right word, but uh, you know just knowing how and where to implement these things is still difficult. I think for many brewers. Yeah, sure. So uh, we're able to address that from a couple of different facets. One is participation in a, a program through the Brewers Association, which is you know already well founded. And so John Steyer and his and his efforts to you know benchmark these sustain, sustainability uh, things. Is is a program that we're participating in. We okay. didn't create it, so you know th- this is not you know us going out and pioneering this. This has been put into place. So we're participating in a really cool program Excellent. that is relatively young, but we are by no means you know the, the creators of it. So it, it's really cool. We're 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 able to provide our data mm-hmm. and into this program, and that data hopefully will go to some other. Brewery or somebody else who is as interested as we are and help them. Great. The, the other facet is through education that we do sort of on our own behalf. Uh, and that's, you know, partly through social media and trying to tell the story behind the beer because, you know, it's one thing to make great beer. It's another thing to say that, hey, when you when you pick our six-pack off the shelf, mm-hmm. you're effectively buying 100% renewable energy okay. produced beer. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also encourage 
uh, our, our staff to go and, and, and talk and participate in the education aspect of things. So uh, I make it a point, you know, personally to, to go and, uh, you know, go back to UC Davis Extension Program, for example, and mm-hmm. give and give talks. Uh, I have another one coming up here shortly where I'm talking about sustainability. Okay. It's not covered as, as a standard curriculum. Right. You know, it's... Uh, a lot of these schools, the, the focus is to try to get you into, you know, a brewing career. You need to learn the, the nuts and bolts, the basics. Uh, sustainability is a side note. Mm-hmm. When we have another water crisis, it won't be a side note. There right. will be, no, a, sure. you know, there will be a monkey knife fight for <laughs> clean drinkable water, and we don't want to get to that point. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, other members of our team um, who I'm very proud of. We have an awesome, awesome team, pretty uh, high level members who have gone out and, you know, made a, an effort to go out and, 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 and give talks and things like that. So um, actually our, our director of uh, logistics and sustainability has gone back to his alma mater oh. uh, of Santa Clara and has given talks about wow. sustainable big business practices. And all that kind okay. Of stuff. Yeah. Nice. Re- really cool. Anyway, so. The overarching it's nice theme. that it's a part of, an, of like the Davis program, where people, where, you know, people trying to get an education in beer and mm-hmm. find out what you need, what, what you might want to do. Right. Yeah. Whether you remember the details doesn't matter. This, you know that's something you should consider. Yeah, I actually, it's like if you find yourself starting a new brewery from ground zero, like mm-hmm. you did, it'd be good to know like how to size, you know, the kind of system, you, you know. Not to mention the yeah. Brewers Association compiling this data yeah. and making it available. Right. You know. Yeah, and very few people uh, are aware that they have published. It's this really well thought out, well researched a sustainability mm-hmm. manual, mm-hmm. and all of this stuff is very you know through a couple of web links is really readily available. It's really nice. cool stuff, groundbreaking. Sure. I like it, but it, but it requires participation in order to give it some venom, to give it some bite. We got to get some other people on board with this effort who are willing to share their data and everything mm-hmm. else. Sure. So we we did a little bit of a, an extra. Um, uh, you know, spend which I thought was very well justified in building the brewery. That we we put lots of data capture instrumentation around places. So our glycol system has flow meters and temperature sensors that will read back to a, a main server, and it records for up to six months. So nice. I can go, I can go back and see you know if our chiller has been used at its optimum efficiency or not. Okay, which tanks have been doing that? Uh, we also have a series of uh, it's around a dozen, maybe it's twelve or thirteen. Flow meters, water flow meters, to pinpoint exactly where it is that we use water around the brewery. Oh. Excellent. Um, and again, we are not pioneers of this. There's others before us. Uh, you know, even locally, uh, Bear Republic has been doing things like this to try to bring their water ratio down, mm-hmm. and it's all great. But you know, I really tried to use as many of these in the design implementation of this mm-hmm. blank slate that yeah. I, you know, was lucky enough to get this opportunity to, to build. To put them all into one place so that we could really arm these, you know, elite team members that sure. I was able to work with to, you know, get to give them this this ammo to go yeah, out and collect the data. Yeah, no, really, really cool. And even talking about how this technology is not new, I mean, some mm-hmm. of the sensors are, and maybe some of the efficiency is. But mm-hmm. I mean, back to to German brewing where they're recapturing uh, heat from water, uh, yeah. recapturing CO two is still a standard. Many many of the things that were just considered brewing, not sustainable brewing, yeah. um, were lost. I think in the American craft beer boom uh, yeah. because maybe they they were neither cost efficient or even even known about a whole lot as home brewers were transitioning into pro brewers exactly. whereas brewing yeah. was such a, uh, a national uh, tradition in places like germany that these sure. things just kept being handed down it's just how you brewed sure yeah um we we live in a uh, an area where some raw materials resources utilities are relatively inexpensive uh i guess when you yeah. You know, f- feel like you oversee the security of petroleum products, you get some sort of employee discount. I, I can't speak to that, but yeah. I can say that maybe there's a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, you know, tossing these these potential problems with inefficiencies over the shoulder because things are so cheap here. Sure. You know, water is five bucks per thousand gallons industrial even co2 okay. delivered it's yeah. like not, not that expensive right but yeah. in, like in europe in germany where they had it to, might be it's probably very expensive yeah, yeah. yeah. anything yeah. moved around co2 yeah. is yeah. you know if you're a large large user less than 10 cents a pound really? okay i mean yeah yeah, yeah it's, so it has a huge impact so um the thought is maybe not right now that this is a really really important topic okay. but given the trends that we're seeing um, or one 
natural disaster away from being an yeah. extremely important topic and the ability to treat your own water or you know not draw upon certain utilities really really heavily could be extremely beneficial that's an excellent point i mean you're, you're kind of saying that you're not going to save all that much money right now by doing these practices and you may not even be saving all that much uh, energy or resources but at as it gets better and as you say maybe the day that we need it why wait till then Sure. So, so there's, a, there's a vast array. There's certain things that may not pencil out for three to five years. Yeah. There okay. are others that are just kind of silly. It's, it's really just an educational gap. There's some things that are pay off immediately. <laughs> okay. That some people just don't, you know, may not know the right questions to ask. Yeah. Um, and so that could be, you know, uh, specifying a premium efficient pump you know or another extra tank to put something into to use it later kind of yeah thing. yeah yeah uh, a little bit of reuse um yeah. exactly is sort of the thing you know okay. I, i've used this caustic to clean a tank hey maybe i you know i can use a small vessel to store that and use it another time uh things like that i mean some of these things in fact almost all of them are not technical te- technologically very advanced where we're talking about some like heat exchangers and storage sure. vessels right i mean mm-hmm. one of one of the things that uh, i sought out was a, a way to get rid of the traditional concept of co2 vaporizer so as a brewery when you when you buy bulk co2 it comes to you at like minus 92 fahrenheit cryogenic liquid co2 mm-hmm. and you have to heat that co2 up vaporize it to get it to a point where it's usable in the brewery okay and conventionally that's done with these really huge electric heaters that take you know like 480 volt power and you got to crank out this big build of pg and e every week or month or whatever to pay for that okay um and so there's this technology out there that and i say technology almost ironically it's a heat exchanger and you yeah. pump your glycol through it uh, this really really cold stuff through it one side yeah and some warm water on the other or something whatever uh, in this case it's our it's our house glycol which circulates okay. at about uh, oh. 26 fahrenheit I see. and it warms up it's enough warming to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. and so it's it's counterintuitive. It's actually, it's Some actually people below say, freezing. Yeah, but it's warm enough to make it go to a, a yeah, yeah. gaseous state. Yeah, you're, you're using a coolant. Wow. To yeah. warm up your CO2. <laughs> your CO2. Sure. And, yeah, and it chills your glycol. And it chills so, our glycol. So your chiller doesn't have to work <laughs> right. as hard. Yeah. So yeah. you know whatever the number is off the top of my head, I want to say it's like 125 BTU per pound of CO2 or something like that from the sales brochure. Please don't quote me. Yeah. Here come the emails. <laughs> anyway, um, it it has a it has a synergistic effect where we both reduce the load on our chiller and Pick get what we want to do. Yeah. Without. Um, not Excellent. only buying that giant piece of equipment right. that heats the CO2, right. um, but paying for the that 480 drive. volts it takes to run it and all that. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And energy is expensive in California, so uh, it it's is. extra helpful here. It is. And you mentioned you know, that if somebody buys a six-pack of yours, they, it's, it's made from 100% renewable energy. Does that mean all of the power coming to your building is from wind or solar? Or yeah, yeah. Um, really, really cool to be able to say that because there was – there was a time when, in order to be able to say that, you had to actually have your own wind farm and solar panels and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And as much as we really wanted to do that day one with our brewery, uh, it wasn't really logistically or, or, or financially possible to put this huge solar array on top. So instead, we partnered up with Sonoma Clean Power, and they offered us the ability to, uh, you know, to buy power at a, a certain rate, which was, you know, a little bit more than usual, mm-hmm. but. Uh, what it enabled us to do is purchase power from the geysers, um, oh, which is up thermal, in Geyserville. Yeah, yeah, yeah this uh, you know <laughs> geothermal power. So, it's incre- incredibly amazing circular thing here. We process most of our own wastewater, but that which we don't process goes to Santa Rosa Municipal Wastewater Treatment. Mm-hmm. They process all the wastewater for the local area and everything else, and they process it to a point where it's technically potable okay which is really neat yeah but they can't sell it as potable whatever else most of it goes to you know uh, waterways and things like that but some of it goes into this giant pipeline that runs about 40 miles up to geyserville hmm. oh, and, and that water is injected down into the uh, geothermal wells and produces the electricity that we use <laughs> to, pr- to nice. produce our beer yeah it's this incredibly cool you know like circular thing <laughs> and uh you know I, I get a huge kick out of it absolutely um, yeah, yeah it's, it's cool. that's really really neat that's yeah neat. i 
was years ago, maybe 13 years ago or something, I did an interview with Uinta Brewing Company out in Utah. And they ex- explained to me at that time that all of their energy was renewable. It came from wind farms around uh, Utah that they were just were able to order through their electric company. Mm-hmm. And back then, I, I was amazed by it, right? I, th- I thought, well, this is cr- it's crazy. It wasn't available in California mm-hmm. at the time. And it seems so futuristic to me. And, and I guess in some ways it is because even now, like you said, in California, it's, it's recent that you're able to uh, order 100% renewable energy. Yeah. So yeah, things have yeah. changed. We're uh, we're merely uh, lucky that that we happen to be so proximate yeah. to this really interesting, you know, uh, renewable energy source. If if we were somewhere else, we wouldn't necessarily be able to take advantage of that. But but it is based on locale. So there are some places where maybe a brewery could uh, take part uh, of purchasing their energy from a solar farm or a wind farm or whatever else. We just happen to be proximate to this geothermal place who well, you know which also you have to be called to be, seismic brewing too yeah it's so like yeah, all yeah. in the same vein of course right so yeah we Part got, of the circular thing we got lucky about. there um that is pretty awesome uh, yeah. it, it also happens that you know i'm really proud of the fact that you know sonoma county the, this whole story thing is kept very local um the the property that it that is owned privately by this uh family that homesteaded out here uh, a ways ago um who owns the the land that PG&E operates all these geothermals on, uh, this guy is actually a, a friend of ours. Nice. And, you know, we had been participants in the, the whole uh, renewable energy program for months, yeah. uh, coming up on years before we got a chance to meet this guy. And we're like, are you kidding me? We're, we're sitting here drinking beers, and it turns out your family has... <laughs> Owned the, the, the property the that we, wow, you yeah, know, really, yeah. really cool. This this incredibly uh, complicated, intertwined story of Sonoma County, and uh, it's it's really great. Every sure. little aspect of it is really interesting. As an aside, I just read today that uh, virtually all of the uh, new energy produced in California last year was uh, renewable. Um, so it was something like. It was literally something like over 98% of new energy produced is coming from um, renewable resources like that. Awesome. The caveat was that it was that part of that is because of the reduction in coal, too. So it was almost at even. They reduced coal by X amount. So it wasn't that we got 99% more energy right. to use, That's unfortunately. Right. It was it sort of balanced out. However, uh, it's still swinging in the way of renewable, which means to me more breweries like yours and everybody else yeah. will be able to make those choices in yeah. the near future. Um, to choose. Make a difference. Good for you guys. We read different articles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and read them differently. I read, I mean, the last article I wrote was about the guy with the world's largest penis who wants a reduction. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, different. Yeah. Yeah. Is, different. It, is it a renewable <laughs> different reduction? World. It's 98%. It's a renewable. Renew- All penises <laughs> like to be renewable. I bet he's sustainable. Until <laughs> 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 so you reach a certain age and then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Seismic Brewing Company, you can go to SeismicBrewingCo.com. Um, I also uh, was reading a couple articles on you guys today over at CraftBeer.com, and they did a couple features on your sustainable brewing practices. So you can go to CraftBeer.com and check it out there. And you can learn more about Seismic Brewing Company at SeismicBrewCo.com. Go check it out. It's a great website, and you can learn a lot more uh, like we did today from Andy. Andy, thanks for hanging out with us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm among legends. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, That's true. You've got. Uh, we've just got a few minutes left in the program. If you want to hang out, uh, one thing we got to do, of course, is our Twitter game. Oh, God. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh yeah. Uh, Doc's tattoo. Uh, oh, my to, God. I believe our Twitter game today was to figure out what <laughs> back tattoo Doc is going to get. Yes. Um, which he'll be getting uh, very soon, uh, possibly tomorrow after this program. Right. Uh, uh, hey, if it's, it's good enough for Dave Malalalove, <laughs> it's good enough for Doc. That's right. Let's Could we go. do it in studio next week? Or two weeks from now, I guess? I got, if you got a needle, I got a pin full of ink. We can jail tap oh, this motherfucker. Wow. Yeah. We'll have to do a long show for a full back tattoo. <laughs> um, all right, so what were our submissions this week? Uh, well, I will say we had some pretty good uh, some pretty good ideas oh, here, Bray. Good topic. Good idea. But unfortunately, I did have to whittle them down. Oh, sure. just to the good ones? Uh, ben Northheim says, wait, Doc's not dead? Okay. Has Doc been gone as long as me? Funny. Uh, Probably longer. We don't really know. Okay. Doc here is like a vision. Even when he's here, you dream. Yeah, you you don't know if he's here. I'm always here. (laughs) (laughs) Even when I'm not. Uh, Blobberglop 
Yeah. The rare blob or glop sighting, who, by the way, is in the chat room talking to himself about renewable energy. I love it. So yes. oh. there's that. Um, he says, a tattoo of his dental records on one ass cheek in case they only find a partial corpse. <laughs> <laughs> they find that part. I mean, you would think that the dental records themselves would serve. You don't need a tattoo of them, yeah. but it's hey, blobber logic. <laughs> if if <laughs> all of his do? teeth are missing. Yeah, I right. guess so. That's, uh, that's the, what happens when you live you know, 900,000 miles away from your next neighbor. Well, although... Yeah. Uh, Blobber could be if he's killed by professionals like the mafia, they mm-hmm. would know to take the teeth. So or yeah. doc parties, you never know what happens. He'll <laughs> knock his own goddamn teeth out. Right, right. you don't know who I'm with. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right, uh, Brandon M says I left home on blank. I was with blank. If found, <laughs> please call blank. <laughs> Fill in the blanks with magic marker each night before he goes out. Oh, yeah. oh no, we're just uh, writing the erasable part. Yeah, because <laughs> we have well, to like change it. it. That's a fun- lot. That's functional, right there. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the blanks are just, you know, underlined. Yeah. It's yeah. like a Mad Lib. But it can't yeah. be permanent ink. No. <laughs> no. For a couple right. of days. It has to be 12 hour ink. Right. Yeah. At um, least. <laughs> Ryan Turner says a permanent set of nutters. Okay. Imagine getting On a tattoo back. of shorts. <laughs> Now. And then, uh, last but not least, Jared Conley says the faces of the BN crew in the style of Mount Rushmore. Ooh. <laughs> all right. Those Ooh. are all oh, good. Yeah. Where I can't see it. <laughs> you wouldn't want to. No. Not at all. All right. To recap, we've got dental records on his ass cheek. Um, we've got uh, fill in the blanks of where he's been, who he was with, when he left, etc. Um, a pair of nutters tattooed to his entire self, um, and all the faces of the Brewing Network in, Roush, in, in Mount Rushmore style. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're gonna have to vote on this. I think they're too good. Usually, well, can I, I make can, a nomination? Uh, yeah. I mean, is, that, is it open for nomination? Well, we're, you, well, you mean your vote? No, 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 no. Vote you, is, uh, I mean, he's got an input. I'm gonna oh. vote for a finalist. What are we gonna vote on? Like one or two. Right. Oh, you want to narrow it down? Yeah, whatever. Okay. Uh, What's your nomination? I like to fill fill in the blanks. Okay. I thought you had your own input. No, no, no. Like you had some tasty wisdom. I I can't play. (laughs) I'll also nominate that one as a finalist. Anybody else want to nominate a finalist? I like that one. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of that. Is there any other finalist? Come on. Let's throw in the Mount Rushmore one. Okay. Oh, yeah, I like that, too. Yeah. All right. Okay, so those are our two, then. We'll leave you it won't at that. See it. Uh, sorry, Dental Records and Nutters. You guys are out of the running. Uh, okay, raise your hand if it's the faces of the BN in the uh, shape of uh, Mount Rushmore. <laughs> no votes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I like the idea, though. It'll be, yeah, uh, that's a good runner-up. JP, read it again. Read our winner so we get the full thing instead of my synopsis. Uh, the blanks one? Yeah. Um, quote, I left home on blank. I was with blank. If found, please call blank. <laughs> that's our winner. Yeah, today, right, great. Yeah, good job, bro. All right. Uh, JP will I'm take gonna... care of you, and Bevo will be sure to send you a prize. For... I'm going to have some temporary tattoos made of that, too. <laughs> that's a really oh, sure you will. Yeah, that's really Actually, good. Actually, that might be our new Brewing Network T-shirt. Put it on the shirt. Right there. I can think of somebody else in that room who would benefit from that tattoo. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Shimei. Okay. (laughs) T-shirt. Would benefit from that tattoo. Might have to get that made. Maybe that could be our next uh, um, temporary T-shirt where you only get two weeks to buy it. I like it. Cool. Yeah. All right, uh, before we go, uh, don't forget about uh, our Adam and Eve discount. They're determined to help you spice things up in the bedroom, and they're backing up that promise. Go to adamandeve.com. you get 50% off any item, uh, almost any item, uh, when you enter coupon code BNARMY at checkout. And uh, that's a good deal in and of itself, but backed by popular demand for a limited time, you're also going to get the free Big O kit. The Big O kit includes exclusive Climax gel, a mini vibrator, um, and then I think you also still get... Oh, no, that's all you get. You don't get the D- DVDs and all that shit in this one. You just get the big, the big O kit. Plus free shipping, um, plus 50% off just about any uh, item. Go to bnarmy.com. Uh, sorry, enter bnarmy at adamandeve.com. Man, I haven't done that read in a while either. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Um, that's a saddle feeling. I haven't shopped there in a while either. Oh, you don't have that autofill? Every time you go to the website. It's a subscription service. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, Alexa, give me a dildo. <laughs> that works. That's true. Um, all right. Uh, did I get everybody taken care of? I think I did. Uh, Andy, thanks once again for being in here. I appreciate yeah. it. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. The beer is good, Great folks. Avenue. So if you can find it on the shelf, do so. Or go to seismicbrewco.com. I think you can find out where to buy it there. Are you guys available outside of California yet? Not yet. Not no. yet? Okay. NorCal only for yeah. the time being. Yeah. Got it. Uh, how many barrels? Uh, are you guys producing? 
Uh, we'll be about 2500 this year. Okay. If we follow the owner's fantastic, what I like to call, well, actually what he likes to call, hockey stick model. Yeah. We will be at 12000 next year. Wow. Uh, I have enough tanks and equipment to support fifteen. so, uh, you know, nice. here's looking at you, kid. <laughs> oh. Well, we wish you luck. Keep making us great beer, and we'll keep buying it over here. So, Doing yeah. your part. Thank yeah, you. Appreciate right. it. We'll definitely do my part drinking it. Uh, all right. Next week on the program, it'll be live. Live from our Fort Collins Hop Grenade, I will be there talking to the CSU Fermentation Science and Technology uh, Program Director. So uh, another great beer program where you can go learn to be a real brewer, and we'll learn all about that. Doc will be there. Uh, <laughs> I'll so, be there yeah. with uh, his freshly tattooed back. I'm also going to be talking to the guys from uh, a new thing in Colorado called the Beer Fight Club. And they put on these... Uh, <laughs> we don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> they put on these rad events where they invite... Uh, uh, several brewers to compete, and it's kind of a, a um, uh, what's it called? A People's Choice Award. But they do several events, and then they have like a final. Um, they're going to be doing one of their events in uh, April at the Hop Grenade Fort Collins, but he's going to come on the show and talk to us about it. Uh, I love the idea. The, bro- the brewers come in and talk shit to each other uh, at, a, at a bar in Colorado, and they do like uh, you know regionals and then semifinals, and it's a cool thing. I think you can go to beer flight, uh, beerfightclub.com uh, and check it out. They've got their first First final coming up in February in Colorado. So if you're out there and you want to check it out, it sounds like a really cool thing to go do. So go to beerfightclub.com. Doc's going. Um, I'll be there. there. Yeah. Uh, Not to be point Dexter, but you're breaking the first and second rules. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) Except that I'm supposed to uh, talk about it in this case. Uh, It's very, very confusing for me. Imagine being me. I can't. Uh, <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> All right. You want to get us out of here, JP? Sure. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I will see you next week in Colorado. Thank you to our show sponsor, More Beer. You can get absolutely everything you need to make br- great beer at home by going to morebeer.com. Thanks to Andy from Seismic Brewing for coming in and talking about dry hopping and sustainability and a bunch of other stuff. Learn more about them at seismicbrewingco.com. Merge your love of Disneyland with your lack of engaging podcasts and go to earsuppodcast.com as JP, Terrence, Bevo, and Taryn talk about all things Disney. Get on Twitter for some good beer inside at Homebrew Info and follow Nate Smith and Nathan Homebrew, Mike McDowell at Tasty McD, Warren is stuck over at Another Beardy, and the great Beverly is crushing cyberspace at Bevo One. JP fully understands that Twitter is dead and you should follow him on Instagram at Major Jip. Be sure to find the Brewing Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.